then we fade up from the little intro sequence and i say hi everybody my name is jack packard i'm darren mooney and this week uh another lighter week because it's the holidays and oh i'm just so tired uh, and so it's just Darren and I again, and we are going to chat only about Wonder Woman 1984, hashtag WW84. Uh, we'll try to be spoiler free as much as we can. And then, of course, eventually we will we will hit that lever and we will give you warning ahead of time. Uh, uh, you know, we get Wonder Woman a year later. Uh, it is very clearly meant to be a summer blockbuster. <laughs> <laughs> you, but but I mean, Jack, there's clearly at least one key scene that is so integral to like the plot formation and narrative of structure of the movie that communicates this was clearly always meant to be a Christmas blockbuster. And I will not accept anybody saying otherwise. There was one yeah. scene that was clearly not shot later. Yeah, with two different <laughs> actors. Um framed in such a way that they could be on the set at different times, right. possibly respecting COVID uh, restrictions. I don't know. Um, yeah. My, okay. my favorite part watching it, this is no spoiler because it's in yeah. the trailer, is like the fireworks sequence. Like it's, it takes place during the 4th of July, like announcing itself as a wonderful summer yeah. blockbuster yeah. that we're watching on Christmas morning. Beautiful. Um, okay, so like overall, spoiler free, Wonder Woman... Um, like my my overall thoughts is it's perfectly fine it's an adequate acceptable blockbuster movie it has uh, many many issues none of them are necessarily movie breaking not my not my top not the lowest eh, it, it, many issues but it's fine which of course is damnation by the faintest of praise right <laughs> yeah i mean I, my opinion would probably be pretty similar to that where like my my opinion is probably more around the and again it's weird because it ends up at the same place which is it's it's grand mm -hmm. uh but my my opinion is much more along the lines of there are parts of it that i adore parts of it that it, where it's trying to do things that i greatly admire it for taking the swings and, and mm. kind of going for it and there are parts of it where it misses spectacularly and it just makes some terrible terrible errors in judgment um <laughs> and they kind of like as a result it averages out to about grand or fine you know mm. I, I quite enjoy this it is a perfectly serviceable summer movie like again when you talk about like movies that are grand because yeah. this is where this is where having like a scale or a five star system or a good bad thumbs up thumbs down thing doesn't quite work in terms of film criticism is because you know there's a difference between it's grand because it's basically competent it didn't try to do anything and therefore it didn't fail or it's grand because it tried to do everything and not all of it really worked and some of it was quite messy but yeah. a lot of it was interesting and fun and there were bits that i liked and bits that i didn't like and i mean i think those are two different things and i kind of think this goes squarely in the second category for me mm. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, starting on a big positive note, uh, any movie that features, uh, oh, and I, I, I know I want to pronounce her last name Godot, but I know that's wrong. It's Godot, isn't it? Because it Godot. is a hard T, I think. You do want to say Godot, because that's the famous name and, we know. And, and if I'm wrong, blame me for it, yeah. Well, a any, any movie, any scene, any sequence that features Gal Gadot and Chris Pine, you have my money, they have the most wonderful chemistry of any on-screen couple. And I just, I, anytime they were on screen together, I was happy. Their performances were wonderful and the, them together filled me with joy. Absolutely. And I think actually this is something that's kind of interesting. Because I think, I don't know if we've talked about it before, but it's something that people have generally talked about, which is how many of modern kind of like superhero blockbusters in particular are surprisingly sexless, particularly when you compare them to the blockbusters of the 80s and the 90s. Um, <laughs> where like, and it's really odd because like, like characters in movies now are like they look like cheetos they have like really narrow waists and really large shoulders mm -hmm. and they're very much designed to be gazed at uh, whether yes. male or female wise and you have things like chris evans like chopping wood which is you know technically objectively hot but you have like in these movies you have this really weird resistance to there being sexual tension between characters whatsoever and like the example that i think of uh when i think of this is say captain america civil war where they introduce the character, the love interest for Steve, who is, by the way, the niece of his original love interest, which is a little creepy, but let's not get into that right now. But uh, you can... If we could pause for a moment. Sharon Carter. Very creepy. I don't want, like, <laughs> it's not a little creepy. Significantly creepy. But 
Okay, we, we agree with that. The Sharon okay. and Peggy Carter thing is is yes. weird. Um, yeah. And the way in which the movie doesn't dwell or explore or touch on or acknowledge that weirdness makes it somehow even weirder. Right. Um, and, uh, and a, I think... fr- a friend of mine once coined uh, scenes like that as making sure that the characters have the not gaze. That's exactly it. That's exactly what yeah. I was about to say. Like oh, the okay. only reason that the Sharon Carter exists in Civil War and the only reason <laughs> that Captain America kisses Sharon Carter in Civil War is so that fans who are watching it and thinking, hey, man, this relationship between Steve and Bucky, it's it's really, really close. And they have like this tremendous chemistry towards them that like male and female leads generally don't have in movies anymore. They have this kind of chem- chemistry and imagery. So, you know, I mean, maybe there's something there. Maybe we're getting a gay Captain America. And the movie's like, no, nope, no, you're not. And absolutely not. Just in case Stamp. we're clear. Put that, yeah. put the not gay stamp on it. I know, like this movie is technically about Captain America's new relationship with his new man and confronting his ex, but no, 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 not gay, yeah, not gay, not absolutely to be clear. <laughs> and I mean, like, and again, like Hobson Shaw is a similar sort of thing where it's like the the core point of Vanessa Kirby's character in Hobson Shaw is not so that she can flirt with the Rock. It's so that you know that when the Rock and Jason Statham are flirting with each other, that they're not going to bone because that may make some people uncomfortable, which is very strange. But, like, that's generally how romances work in modern blockbusters. It's, right. it's as you point out, the not gays. So mm-hmm. I really like, what I really like about both of the Wonder Woman movies is the fact that they do put that romance front and central. And that, like, Gadot and Pine work really, really well together. And actually, to be fair so to, to Pine, I think, like, you know, we'll talk about Gadot later on, I suspect. But one of the things I really admire about Pine as an actor is that he is genuinely an, an incredibly generous screen partner. He works really well in ensembles, as I would argue in the Star Trek movies, whatever you think mm. of them. I think that he works remarkably well in those ensembles. Um, yes. He obviously also has a relationship with Jenkins, um, having worked with her on, was it TNT, uh, that TV show, was it In the Night or something like that, the one about the, the Black Dahlia case oh. um, as well. Like he's, he's got this kind of long running relationship and he's done a host of stuff, which is kind of like low key stuff, which you, which you wouldn't expect. And he's probably my favorite Chris for that reason, because he shows up in things like Horrible Bosses too, which is not a good movie, but he's having a good time <laughs> and he seems to be happy to work with people who are having a good time with him. Right. And like, I really love the moments in Wonder Woman 1984 where the two of them are together where they're just walking along the mall in Washington, D.C., and they're dancing in the night, and they're just enjoying each other's company. Mm -hmm. Or the moment when Steve, you know, in what might be an anachronism, but let's face it, won't be the only anachronism in the movie, where Steve is amazed by the workings of an escalator, which is just a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful sequence. Um, And again, the fact that it, it does that while it reverses the kind of dynamic from the original film where she was the fish out of water and he was like, hey, come into my world. It's wonderful mm-hmm. and marvelous. And she's like, no, 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 come into my world. It's wonderful <laughs> and marvelous. And yeah. and again, this is where we're going to touch on things that I think we'll get into a bit later. But there are two things that I really, really like about the use of Pine in this movie, the bring back of Steve Trevor, because generally I'm not a big fan of, well, look, this character died in a previous movie, but people like him. So let's bring him back. Uh, mm-hmm. Fan service kind of stuff is that, first of all, I think that he's integrated remarkably well uh, in terms of plot and in terms of theme. And that I think what the movie is saying and how it uses him to say that, I th- okay, we're going to argue about that. That's going to be fun. The, uh, um, oh, and for anyone just listening to this, I am currently waving my hand back and forth to say, well, yeah, maybe. <laughs> I mean, you know, logically, let's let's say, but thematically, we'll, you know, we'll uh, we'll get there in, in spoiler well, yeah. talk, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, but but yeah, basically, but yeah, the Wonder Woman <laughs> podcast, um, and. I, and in terms of kind of the other stuff that I kind of I really like about the the integration of kind of Steve into the story mm. is is the fact that just he again he just he I think that he works really well he has really great chemistry with Gadot and he's used in interesting ways. Now again he also inevitably comes into what we're going to talk about in more depth later on, which is the sense in which the movie maybe bites off some stuff that it doesn't properly chew or process mm. in that the. While I think thematically how it uses him is very clever, I think the mechanics involved are not necessarily given the uh, tension or focus or contemplation or digestion or, (laughs) hey, wait, has anybody stopped and thought about what this actually means in terms of characters that aren't the two people that we care about in this relationship? (laughs) He says, without spoiling it or hoping that he's not spoiling it. No, Um, you're not spoiling. I I think that's that's a good general blanket like criticism for the movie to be spoiler free is just to say that the universe outside of the characters on camera doesn't get paid a lot of attention. And sometimes... Like, like if, if the movie moves and it's fast and it's fun to watch, then you don't really care about stuff like that. 
Um, there, you know, but sometimes this movie is slow enough where you start to think about stuff like that. I know, you know, I, I've, I've seen a few like nitpicks here and there about Wonder Woman and like the world and how much they pay attention to it. And some of them are genuine and some of them are bullshit, you know, like, and, and this is spoiler free, uh, the spoiler free, uh, because you see it in the trailer is Steve Trevor, a World War One pilot. Uh, is able to fly a modern for the 80s jet airplane. And I've seen some stuff online of people calling BS on that. And you know what? Who cares? He's a pilot. I, None of that matters. I, I mean, he magically comes back from the dead. I feel like that's the first like logical gap there right. in that like character beat. It's like this magic resurrected World War One <laughs> fighter pilot can magically fly a jet. And it's like, yeah, flying the jet's not the problem there. That's not where you require the suspension of disbelief. <laughs> well, right. And it's like, it's like you have to pick and choose your battles. He's a pilot. He knows how to fly a plane. Sure. Like the <laughs> the logic leap is a very tiny one there. And That's not the issue. Yeah. Particularly given everything else that happens in that sequence. And again, <laughs> we can't mention that because some of it happens later on and it's possibly spoilery. Yes. But like there are elements of that scene that I'm like, yeah, the fact that he's flying this plane is not the improbable aspect of it, I would argue. Right. Right. And so it's like the... Overall, though, like to to kind of pivot to like a, a spoiler free problem, which is kind of like the pacing and the work and the 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 pacing of the movie, I guess, is there are big dips. It's a long movie. It's two hours and 32 minutes. We just looked this up before we were recording. <laughs> we Jack thought it was two hours and 43. And I can understand why you felt that way. Um. <laughs> it's very long. And it it is trying, like you said, like you said, very magnanimously, it's trying to accomplish a lot of things. And so it's dipping its hand in a lot of different buckets. And unfortunately, that means that there are several down points of the movie where you do start thinking about stuff like that, where you start thinking about, wait a minute, could he really fly that jet? Wait a minute, Wonder Woman seems to be all around Washington, D.C., yet Batman was only able to find one picture of her from World War One. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Huh, let me see what? here. <laughs> well, careful there, Mr. Internet. I mean, I, I would argue, like, my, <laughs> my problem with the logic of the movie, and again, this is, I want to be very careful how I frame this now. Mm. The logic of the movie is very much fairy tale logic. Um, like, unapologetically fairy tale logic. And, like, unrepentantly and unapologetic fairy tale logic and i hmm. i kind of understand that and i kind of get that and i kind of admire it but the problem is exactly what you suggest which is the moment that the movie dips its toe into things that are bigger than it or perhaps to put it frankly more realistic or grounded than fairy tale <laughs> logic like say and again very vaguely not going to talk any specifics because it's in the trailer let's say the middle east Let's just pick the Middle East as an example here. If you try to apply fairy tale logic to the Middle East, it can perhaps come across as um, condescending or, or, or <laughs> simplifying or um, naive or you know Ooh. politically um, iffy. Perhaps would be the best way to describe it. Or if you try to apply fairy tale logic to say the foreign policy of President Ronald Reagan, it can perhaps also appear hopelessly naive and optimistic and ill thought out and ill considered. Um, and I think actually to give the movie credit, because again, I worry, this is the thing where it's like, I'm going to be extremely positive and I'm also going to be extremely negative. It, uh, somewhere in the middle will be but where it's, I might. But it's life. both, right? Yeah. Like this this is this is why the podcast exists. Because like, you know, if we were to give this a star rating, my guess is like both of us would say like out of five, uh, two and right. a half. It's yeah, fine. Right. Two and a half, yeah. three. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> like right down the middle. <laughs> yeah. But so, but so like, you know, we get to now like say, oh, these are things I enjoy. Yeah. These are things I don't enjoy. That's fine. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Um, but no, it, it, there's a lot of that with the movie where there's a lot of elements where it's very much like, yeah, but did anybody sit down and think about it? And what what I think actually, to, to be fair, like the unqualified problem I have, because I mean, even that is a goal. Even that's like, I understand what they're trying to do and I get mm. what they're trying to do. And I don't think it works, but I admire them for trying it mm. to bring it back to the overstuffed thing. Um and this is something that bugs me about it, and really bugs me about it, is that there is, like, despite the fact it is a two hour and 32 minute film, which is a long <laughs> amount of time by, by most measures. I mean, I think it is longer. Is it about as long as the theatrical code of Batman versus Superman? I think it's longer than the Avengers movie, uh, the, the first one as well, in terms of just being a Wonder Woman movie. Sure. Um, that sort of stuff. It's longer than The Dark Knight. I think it's about as long as The Dark Knight Rises, that sort of thing, right? Mm -hmm. But what I would say, having that amount of time, 
it still somehow seems to shoehorn in a number of significant plot developments without any foreshadowing or thought or consideration for them. Um, and you can tell what those developments are and you can tell why they're being shoehorned in because the answer is, it's a Wonder Woman movie. They have to be there. And again, we're just talking about what's in the trailer. So let's just go for it. Things like Barbara Minerva, played by Kirsten Wig, hmm. who is a friend of Wonder Woman, who has her own arc. And I actually really like most of the arc. I like two hours of the two hour and a half arc that she has. <laughs> um, at, at one point, like, like Jack, to, to, to explain this, like we, I went to a cinema screening of this with Irish critics and it was great. We all came out afterwards and we're like, that was pretty good, wasn't it? Until it wasn't. And it was like, yes, we all agree. There was a moment where it just stopped being good. Um, and Very that moment... similar to Wonder Woman 1. <laughs> well, we'll come back to that one. <laughs> um, but the but the moment, the moment for us where that happened was the moment where Barbara Nerva, who's had this character arc, which again, we could argue about the merits of the character arc, whether it's a cliche, whether it's sufficiently developed, whether or not it's something you've seen done countless times before, whether it does anything interesting or new, but at least it is a character arc. You Correct. go A, B, C, this is where the character ends up. Mm -hmm. And then for some reason, about 30 minutes from the end, she says, I would like to be a CGI cheetah person. I really like the movie Cats, I guess. It's basically what she says and turns into a CGI cheetah person. And mm -hmm. there is no reason in the context of the film for that to happen. You have never seen anything that indicates that Barbara Minerva is particularly interested in cats. She is a cryptozoologist, but it never comes up in terms of plot. She likes the fact that Diana wears cheetah print shoes, but it never comes up in the plot. She at one point wears like a cheetah skin wrap around her where she's being a bit badass, but it's never like, huh, I particularly like this design and think that it would be a cool thing for me to do. She literally just says, I want to be like nobody else. And the response is, well, okay, you are a cheetah person. That, that's what you get. And the reason that is, is because Cheetah is an iconic Wonder Woman baddie. She is the Wonder Woman baddie who is the equivalent of the Joker for Batman or Lex Luthor for Superman. So mm. if you are doing a Wonder Woman movie, you have to have Cheetah in there. And if you have Cheetah in there, you have to turn her into a cheetah person. But do you? Because... No, she... no, you don't, Jack. That was a rhetorical question. Uh -huh. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Because I was, <laughs> I thought you might have been serious there for just a moment. That's the part, like... And, and yes, we can talk about this spoiler free because you see it in the trailer. She is... Like, she is Cats. She yeah, is, she's Taylor Swift. She's, she's like Taylor, Taylor Swift, Swift from Cats. Yeah. Um, and... There is no reason for her to be that, even can canonically in some runs of the comics. She's yeah. just wearing a suit. Yeah. You could just have her wear a leopard suit, which she was already wearing earlier in the film. Yeah, yeah no, like this is this is my problem with, with the cheetah thing. Again, this is where Darren goes down a little wormhole and is like, I apologize to listeners who don't care about comics. But like the <laughs> difference between... And again, this is where probably later on we'll talk about the difference between Wonder Woman and Batman and Superman. Mm -hmm. But the difference between Wonder Woman's arch enemy Cheetah and characters like Lex Luthor or like the Joker mm -hmm. is that like from, you know, when the Joker first premiered back in Batman number one, the Joker's had a pretty steady gimmick. He is a dude who looks like a clown and is a homicidal maniac. And you can do all sorts of different things with that. But mm -hmm. fundamentally, he is a dude who looks like a clown and is a homicidal maniac. So you can get, like, the Gotham version of the Joker there. You can get the Heath Ledger version of the Joker there. You can get the Jack Nicholson version of the Joker there. And God help you, you can d get the Jared Leto version if you want to. Uh, I guess we're getting more of that. I don't know. Um, but let's... You that's, do you. Yeah, whatever works for you. Zach, it's all good. Um, but the, the other thing that I would do... But, like, and again, like, Lex Luthor is perhaps slightly different because, you know, he was originally a gangster and stuff like that. But mm. largely speaking, we've kind of settled down on this idea that he's a businessman. That's what he yeah. is. Didn't say the John Byrne uh, reboot of kind of, like, of Superman, Lex has been a businessman. He's intellectual. He's bald. Uh, in the animated series, he owns Metropolis. In the comics, he's become the president of the United States. So mm -hmm. we get that, like, that's the archetype of who Lex Luthor is. Cheetah, on the other hand, never really had that solid a thematic or, like, character center in the way that those two villains had. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular, it's notable that the version uh, that appears in the movie, Barbara Minerva, I believe originated in the George Perez Wonder Woman reboot uh, that came after Christ on Infinite Earth, which notably was obviously, yep, it was a huge influence on the first Wonder Woman as well, because mm -hmm. that was where you got the big Ares causes war. Wonder Woman leaves the Themyscira to go and oh. fight Ares and solve war plot, which was sure. the basis of Wonder Woman 1. In, in contrast to Golden Age Wonder Woman, which went off to fight Hitler. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and again, like, and, and also did bondage stuff, which we're not going to touch mm. because this is for families, uh, apparently. So we're cool with that. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, 
I mean, there's probably some sex stuff we could touch on later on in the podcast that we need to unpack a bit. But the movie's like, no, 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 don't think about that. It's best not to worry too much about that. But like, um, but to bring back to Cheetah is that like Cheetah doesn't have that essence. The, the version that appears in the movie is Barbara Minerva, mm. who first appeared in 1986. But throughout, she's been constantly rebooted and rewritten and reworked. And writers have never really said, well, here is the core essence of who she is. Mm-hmm. They've always reinvented her. And she's never really had like a, this is why Barbara is the arch Wonder Woman baddie. This is why Cheetah has to fight Wonder Woman. Why she couldn't, for example, fight, I don't know, Aquaman or Vixen <laughs> or like, you know. any Because probably... cats hate water, dear. <laughs> yeah, see, that's why she'd be the perfect arch enemy. I kind of just love the idea that Aquaman would have this arch enemy and he's got, he's never done anything to her except exist. And she's just like, I hate him so much. I'm trying to but get yeah. rid of the world's water. That's <laughs> yeah, it. <laughs> yeah. See, there we are. We've, we've solved Cheetah in, in two lines, but no, that, that, that's, that's the problem. But the problem is because she's been around so much, she has to be there. And the movie's like, well, look, we did a, we did a big Wonder Woman movie and we didn't have Cheetah in her. It's mm-hmm. the sequel. We have to have Cheetah in there. Yeah. And she has to be the version of Cheetah that looks like the one from the comics that people like and remember. So those are the ones where she is a cheetah person. And it's like, there's no real reason for that. And the movie does that several times. Um, And again, you know, and and all of those times are moments where you go, there's no reason for this to be in the movie. So to pick another example from the trailer, you know, the gold suit that she wears. And thank you for bringing this up. We'll we'll come back to that in the spoiler zone about why that is plot irrelevant. Um, Because it is actually literally plot irrelevant. There's no reason for it. There would be a reason to wear that suit like, 20 minutes earlier in the movie if she chose to do it then but the point at which she chooses to do it it is completely irrelevant and pointless but it only exists because that is a suit that is associated with the character of wonder woman in the comic books i believe it was introduced by mark wade um and alex ross in kingdom come and it's since been Mm. folded into continuity by writers i think like luke ross um and gail simone i kind of folded it into continuity and it's like well okay it's like making batman's eyes turn white uh in the dark knight rises it's a thing from the comics we have to throw it in there it looks good let's just give that nod to them and it's like but you you don't. The movie's already overstuffed. Like, you don't need to add more to it. it not just because it was in the comics. And you know what? I am a huge fan of outfit changes. <laughs> have them. Have them, have them, have them. Great. Like, ha- wear the golden suit. It looks awesome. You look good in it, Gal Gadot. And you know what? Like, I am all for it. But maybe have a reason to put it on is yeah. all we're saying here, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> Aside from the fact it's now the climax of the movie, and it's like, look, Patty, you got to avoid fan service for two hours. you got to pile it all in now. It's like, you're getting the cheetah person, you're getting the gold <laughs> costume, and they're going to be together at the climax. Like, like, I would kind of love it if the gold costume appeared, and again, this is not a spoiler because it's another scene that appears in the trailer, if, mm. like, the gold costume appeared during the Chris Pine costume trying on montage. If it was just, like, Chris Pine came out in this, like, gold Wonder Woman outfit, and you're like, does this work? It's like, well, maybe for the climax it does. Which climax? Sorry, apologies. <laughs> uh, I never apologize for great puns. That's the ru- that's rule number one here. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it, there's a lot of stuff like that where it's two hours and 32 minutes. And yet somehow so much of the movie is underdeveloped because it feels like it's being shoehorned into a movie that doesn't need it, which is really odd when a movie's that long. Well, and and in, in contrast, you know, like we... Like you, you describe this as a very a fairy tale, very fantasy esque, which is a very stark contrast from the first Wonder Woman, which, in my opinion, without spoiling anything, is it was a drastic overcorrection from the criticisms of Wonder Woman one, which really the only criticisms of Wonder Woman one are from the last five or ten <laughs> minutes of the dang movie. <laughs> I, I like, I, I kind of like, I love. Okay, we'll probably save this for the like the what we talk about the, with spoilers. But mm. I love that like the ending of like Wonder Woman one is like we're going to have a big symbolic CGI battle where people throw each other through buildings and shout abstract co- bit, bits of dialogue at each other that are the themes of the movie, while the actual conflict, which is ideological in nature, plays out in the background involving minor supporting characters. Mm-hmm. And it's like, people are like, we really, really hate that. We don't like that. So Wonder Woman 984 goes, okay, how about instead of having characters knock each other through CGI, we just have the monologue about theme at each other while the main conflict plays out thematically in the background with supporting characters. Yes. And it's like, it's like, okay, oh, you, you, you learned the wrong lesson, <laughs> Wonder Woman 84. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so it's like, I, I see Wonder Woman 84 as not just an overcorrection from complaints about Wonder Woman, but as an overcorrection of the Snyder verse in general. 
I feel like this was Patty Jenkins saying, no, 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 we can be bright and colorful and fun just like those Marvel guys. And you know what? We're going to crank that bright and fun up to 11, baby. And you know what? You, you went too far. You got to push it back to like an eight, maybe. <laughs> but he, here's the thing is that like it's set in 1984. And mm. again, I think Jenkins does something interesting, which is people keep talking about how much they love the Richard Donner Superman movies. And, and trust me, I love the Richard Donner Superman movies. Um, but they are very much artifacts of their time. And there are certain elements of which do not necessarily update in a way that makes sense or is particularly comfortable to watch 20 or 40 or 40 years removed from that context. Are and you what referring I think, to Lois Lane's poetry jam session? I mean, that and like the, you know, um, date rape dad Superman, but that's a separate conversation entirely. Deadbeat spade date rape dad Superman. Well, that's more of a Superman return. That's thing. Superman Returns. But it right. does build off the ending of like Superman 2, to be fair. Let's let's put this in context. And like and like that's not that's not that's like I'm not being entirely facetious here. Like mm. there is a big consent morality sex issue at the heart of Wonder Woman 984, but it is exactly the same as the consent issue at the heart of Superman 2 from 1980. Like Ooh, they both play, of. it very yeah. much is like, it, it's very much like these are the sexual politics of 1979, 1980, mm -hmm. and they're fresh served to you today. And nobody's really thought about how those have aged. It's like, do you want to give them a smell? Do you want to do the smell test before you put them in the movie? It's like, no, 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 we're, they're, they're still good. And like, <laughs> that's the thing that I find interesting is that Wonder Woman 1984 is, and this is one of those things where I am both praising it and damning it in the same description. Mm -hmm. It is the most unqualifiedly, unreservedly optimistic superhero movie, in live action at least, possibly going back to the Richard Donner Superman movies, if not going back to Batman 1969. Because <laughs> at the core, and this is the thing where you talk about like the overcorrection from Wonder Woman back in 2017, because Wonder Woman in 2017... Like, people talk about how that was, oh, it was a breath of fresh air compared to the darkness and grimness of, like, the Snyder and Nolan movies. It's like, have you watched Wonder Woman 19, Wonder, the original Wonder Woman? Because Wonder Woman is the most cynical argument about human nature ever constructed. It is basically, Diana. Diana's like, hey, people are great. Man is great. I'm going to journey out into the world. There's a war happening. And the only reason that human beings would kill other human beings is because somebody else organized it because they're being mind controlled or because like another God is influencing them. And mm -hmm. then it turns out Diana spends the next two hours getting that beaten out of her slowly and surely. It's like, well, you saved a village full of French people, but it's like, you know what? They just got gassed. Ha! Ooh, Hope you, you like that. Why? Humans suck, and that's the lesson. And still, Wonder Woman was brighter than Zack Snyder's movies. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, but, but I mean, like, and consistently throughout, like, the core moral of Wonder Woman, and I would argue that it is optimistic in its own way. Like, I, I'm not arguing that it's, like, a dark, grim, dark, cynical movie. The right. core message of the original Wonder Woman was people are bastards, people are terrible to one another, people mm. are not necessarily entirely deserving of charity, compassion, empathy and like saving um mm. all the time if you look at them as a species which is a fairly dark observation to make but in the context of a movie that was released in early 2017 perhaps captured something of the sentiment of the time um whereas you look at something like say wonder woman 1984 which does like the hardest u-turn imaginable at the core of like wonder woman 1984 is but wait what if humans weren't bastards what if human beings at their core were actually just like decent human beings and just wanted what was best. And what if everything that was wrong in the world, everything, what if everything that caused pain or suffering, everything that made anybody uncomfortable, anything that made anybody squirm in their seat, anything that caused harm to another human being, what if that wasn't the result of like malice or, or anger or, or hatred? What if that was just because people didn't have the ability to see past themselves. And as soon as they were able to, as soon as they were able to understand that their mm. desires and their longings, as soon as they understand that those hurt other people, they'd realize and they'd open their eyes and they would immediately act in such a way as to make things better. And again, this is not a spoiler because it happens in the first two minutes of the film. The film opens with an armed robbery of a jewelry store mm -hmm. and a chase through a mall. And during that chase, one of the armed gunmen grabs a child and threatens it as a hostage. Yes. And everybody 
in the movie, including the other armed robbers who literally just tried to rob a jewelry store, say, hey man, that's not cool. What are you doing that for? That's not who we are. We're armed robbers. We're not animals. <laughs> What do you do with that kid, man? Like, the, the, very confusing, by the way, when the armed robbers start going, no, 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 <laughs> yeah. don't do bad things. Yeah. And yeah. you're like, wait a minute. Yeah, like the guy who literally said, don't try anything. It's like, what are you doing? It's like, no. <laughs> it's like, like he literally waves his arms and runs up to like the, the barrier. Is it to say, no, stop. No, this is not no. what we agreed. This is, you read the handbook. This was not in there. Um. Like, and well, the movie and, co consistently yeah. does that. Like, yeah. nobody in Wonder Woman 1984 acts out of malice. Nobody hurts other people because they want to hurt other people or because they think other people want to suffer. They do it because they are scared. They do it because they don't know how powerful they are. Or they do it because they want to advance themselves and haven't thought about the consequences. And, like, that is something that is incredibly optimistic and mm -hmm. humanist. And, you know, people have been saying for decades that, like, superhero movies need to be lighter. They need to be more optimistic. They need to, um, like, they need to be for kids and for families. And they need to stop being so dark and cynical. And it's like, well, you made your wish, possibly using the instrument from the movie that we're talking about here. Uh, monkey paw. You may, probably made your monkey paw rich. And this is what you get. Mm -hmm. And, like, while I admire that and think that is on some level commendable, and I think that it's nice that the movie tried to do that, mm -hmm. we get back to the argument of oversimplification, where it's like, Yes, but in the real world, sometimes people who hurt other people, particularly on the scale that this movie suggests that people hurt other people, and let's be frank, in particular, the person who this movie suggests hurts other people, <laughs> um, aren't doing it because they weren't loved by their daddy. Um, they're doing it because they are terrible people, and stopping them from doing it is probably something that you should prioritize ahead of going, yeah, but they didn't mean it, and if we talk to them, maybe they'll realize how much they don't I, mean it, and everything will be perfect. I, I think, that, like, there, you, you hit on, like, what is, like, one, the big, big problem of this movie, which is the scale of the villainy, right? Which is, like, or the scale of the villainy <laughs> that needs to be turned around, which got so big... <laughs> That you you can barely wrap your head around all of the bad that's happening literally in the entire universe. And then the way in which, uh, you know, our hero, because spoiler alert, our hero tries to fix the villainy. The way in which she tries <laughs> to fix the villainy does not compute. And I, do, I, I definitely want to talk more about letting like uh, I'm trying to be spoiler free here. I want to talk more about having a well-rounded villain versus it's okay to have a bad guy. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. No, you I, know, I, I like, that's very much an issue. And again, like... Which is a big issue in this movie. While we're talking kind of non-spoilery, it's worth pointing out. Like, <laughs> I would argue the Wonder Woman from 2017, I would argue, was the first blockbuster of the Trump era. And I'm not talking in a literal chronological sense. I'm just talking aesthetically in the same way that, say, The Dark Knight was the last blockbuster of the Bush era. Or, like, yeah. Star Trek 2009 was the first era of blockbuster of the Obama era. In oh, that okay. it captured mm -hmm. something of the mood of the time and something of mm -hmm. kind of the ambience in the air. And mm -hmm. that, that ambience was that perhaps people are just bastards. Um, but, you know, I mean, it, it did capture a lot of that. Like, whatever you do, no matter how hard you try, sometimes you won't win. Sometimes good won't prevail. But that doesn't mean that it's not worth trying to do good anyway. Um, right. And again, like, worth noting, around the same time, I think, 2017, you had, like, Stephen Moffat's Doctor Who having an entire series arc, which amounted to, yeah, I do good things. It doesn't always work. Most people die most of the time. But hey, they're still good things. And I do them because they're right. Um, guess that's the best we could do in this situation, I guess, <laughs> with my time travel machine. Um, but, like, that was the core thesis statement. And that's the core thesis statement of Wonder Woman 2017, which is, again, first blockbuster of the Trump era. Mm -hmm. Now, by default, in a literal, chronological, and I would argue thematic sense, Wonder Woman 1984 positions itself as the last blockbuster of the Trump mm -hmm. era, in mm -hmm. that it is closing the book, as it were. And to bring it back to your well-rounded villain versus we need to have a bad guy argument... Watching Wonder Woman 1984 feels a lot like when you read articles or you go on Twitter or you even talk to relatives about this sort of thing. And like at the end of an era that has been tumultuous and difficult and challenging and has brought to fore uh, a number of like systemic problems that are deeply rooted. Mm -hmm. um, everybody going, well, imagine after all that, everybody goes, well, at least we can get back to normal. 
Like, Wonder Woman 1984 <laughs> feels very much like the at least we can get back to normal version of superhero blockbusters, where it's like, gee, this terrible thing happened, which, like, potentially destroyed the world, like, upended reality as we understand it. Uh, mm -hmm. It co possibly caused countless lives. It upended civilization. Everything we thought we knew turned upside down. The rules of reality seem to bend and distort, but at least it's over now and all worked itself out, right? <laughs> well, back to normal. <laughs> yeah. Literally the ending of Wonder Woman 984, as you point out. And again, not to get, yeah. we're not being specific. We're not being spoilery. Yeah. But like, that's the big takeaway is that like, well, yeah. It oh, shouldn't no. be a spoiler that at the end of the day, the hero wins in a superhero movie. Also a prequel to like Batman versus Superman and Justice League. You know, the right. world didn't end, right? I'm, I'm hoping. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So we won't get into specifics just yet. The, the one last spoiler free thing i want to touch on before we dig deep into the themes or lack thereof in wonder woman um is uh, my biggest complaint about it a, a lot of times when i talk about the first wonder woman i will say the entire movie is worth it for the no man's land action sequence alone which you know is a beautiful character moment for diana it's a wonderful action sequence it's also uh, iconic like it's also like a moment that you think mm. of when you think of superhero cinema like it, it's yes. something that you remember which is it's yeah. like iron man flying in the original iron man for example mm. or that round shot of the avengers in the avengers you know it's it's kind of like it's a moment that you think of when you think of superhero cinema. Yeah. Well, but, you know, and, and not just that. It's it's like a it's it's what I love in genre movies. It's when character and the genre yeah. come together. Diana's character is finally at her moment when she is ready to, like, put her life on the line to prove that goodness wins. And we get an awesome action sequence out of it. Boom. Yeah. Perfect. Right. And then everybody dies. And then well, <laughs> because <laughs> it's a 2017 movie. But still. Um... <laughs> but. Um, the action yeah. in Wonder Woman 84 is not only incredibly flat, but a lot of it is laughable in the effects area. They look, I, I very snidely on Twitter compared it to Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 1 in comparison <laughs> to how some of the effects look. And I stand by that statement. They, they look bad they have sequences when when wonder woman is like running really fast and you can almost see the wires holding her up and running really fast it's the effects and action are laughably bad especially when compared with its earlier movie yes and part of me wonders if this is um and again this is one of the things where you you are want to make clear that what i'm saying is not uh moral or aesthetic or quality judgment it's just a statement of how yes. production works it's very similar. It reminds me a lot of um, the theatrical cut of Justice League, where, so, the sets on Justice League are obviously built for Man of Steel and um, obviously Batman versus Superman. And mm -hmm. those movies were designed to be shot in a particular way. Now, how one feels about how that movie was shot, how those movies were shot, is one's own opinion. But the, the matter of fact is, the sets were built and lit in such a way that they would look good on screen at that level of lighting and saturation. Yes. Then you watch, uh, wonder. Then you watch, sorry, the the actual cut of Justice League, and you can tell that somebody has been listening to the internet, and the internet has said these movies are too dark, and somebody has said, okay, I want you to crank up the lighting and saturation on those set, yeah, literally just like push a little knob on the corner, push and, the knob up, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and you can tell that the sets were not built to be shot at that level of lighting and in that level of color detail because all of a sudden they look like something from eighties Doctor Who by comparison, um, and again like. <laughs> And it's terrible. It's and it's true. and it's it's very much along the lines of, well, look, you wanted a movie that was brighter, so you're getting a movie that's brighter. And like part of me wonders if a lot of that stuff with the CGI, and it's notable that like and to be frank, the movie's worst special effect, which is Cheetah, it's notable that that fight takes place at dusk at night, because shooting it in the dark makes it easier to disguise questionable CGI because mm. you don't have to worry about lighting and how lighting reflects and how we're lighting <laughs> that if you just turn the color down. And I mean, I know I, I know that people don't like dark movies or whatever. I know that people have strong opinions about how dark a movie is. But mm -hmm. when you turn up saturation, you turn up lighting, you turn up color, CGI tends to become hyper real. And I know that the Sam Raimi movies were about 20 years ago at this point. But I would argue that a large part of that is also down to the fact that Sam Raimi movies are, like this movie, also hypersaturated, And the brightness and color are turned way up. If you look at the yes. CGI for, say, the comparable kind of contemporary X-Men movies by Brian Singer, which have the colors turned way down, that CGI has generally aged a lot better. Give or take a toad here or there. Yeah. Eh, I mean... 
but and I like and when I refer to CGI and the action, like for example, uh, Brian Singer's X Men is a great example. Anytime Storm flies, you can see where the wire harness is, mm -hmm. and that's just a byproduct of the time. Whereas compare that with say a, a action sequence that takes place during the day in like uh, Captain America: Civil War, the big airport action yeah. sequence. Obviously, you know that that was a big set piece. But you have superheroes flying, jumping, running around during the day, and it looks pretty all right. The I I wonder. I know you know the the Snyder's are still credited as producers, though. I do wonder if you know how hands off, how much more hands off they were in relation to that. Whereas, uh, for for example, sorry, this is a little bit of a tangent. Mm. The the Marvel machine, the reason why we call it the Marvel machine is there is a team that only handles the action sequences. That's it. The, yeah. You know, the director's there to oversee, but the team does all like the stunt coordination, the shot uh, placements, that sort of thing, because that's what they know how to do. On the DC side of things, there is no team for special effects or action sequences and i do wonder if you know zack snyder is a very good action director in general uh is the only praise i will give him uh ever and so and her well oh yes <laughs> and his and his wife who's a, a production partner uh but maybe they were a little more hands-on in that respect in the first wonder woman and a little more hands-off in this one because the action is bad and the reason why i like superhero movies is because I like action movies and I like science fiction movies and superhero movies are a blend of the both. Yeah. And this one didn't uh, scratch my action itch. Um, before we, because uh, I want to come back to the action thing, it is worth pointing out um, that Marvel thing with the hiring of like the team that do the action. I kind of love the story. I think it was Lucretia Martel who was offered the role of directing Black Widow. And she was like, you know that I've never directed action scenes before. And they were like, oh, no, 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 don't worry. We have we have a team that do that. And she's like, no, no I, I want to direct the action scenes. What, <laughs> why would I take a job directing a superhero movie if I couldn't direct the action scenes? What would be the point of me directing a superhero movie if I didn't direct the action scenes? Which I kind of love as far as those yeah. interviews go. Um, <laughs> what I will say, actually, and I find this kind of interesting, is that as a director, and particularly as a director of superhero movies, I, I'm actually generally a huge fan of, of Jenkins. I think Monster, um, her film from, I think, 2003, um, the mm -hmm. one that won Charlize Theron the Oscar, is amazing and, and fantastic and what we're seeking out. As a superhero director, I think what makes Jenkins interesting is that she kind of treats it in the same way. And this is kind of a so, again, this is one of the things where it sounds like I'm going to be like criticizing her, but I'm actually complimenting her. So let's give you a moment here. But it she treats it in the same way that like a lot of modern directors treat westerns or musicals, where it's mm. like, hey, here is a genre. Here are the elements of a genre. Here mm. are things that I have seen other people do in the genre, and I would like to do myself. So you could see like watching the original Wonder Woman. There's a lot of well, I saw the Dark Knight and I really liked it, so we're going to include that sequence in here. Or I saw and like again, I. You know, I know that people have strong opinions about Snyder, but it's like, you could tell that she was just like, well, how did Zack Snyder make a superhero movie? I'm going to do that as well. Like, there's a warehouse scene in Wonder Woman that is very much the warehouse scene from Batman versus Superman, but with Wonder Woman this time, right down to the cranking and slow motion as she, like, tears through the goons inside the warehouse. You're like, I know where she saw that, and I know why she <laughs> likes it. Um, and even here as well, like, even in Wonder Woman 1984, you can see there's, like, Oh, she's doing the truck flip from the Dark Knight. Oh, she's doing the sequence where the hero saves people and then has to, like, wink or ask them to keep her secret identity, like in Spider-Man 2. And I think that I kind of find that interesting as a director. I, I'm i not entirely sure I agree that she's a, you know, I wouldn't say she's the strongest action director. And I think what's interesting about the action Wonder Woman 1984, and we, again, maybe this is something to say for the spoiler zone, I find it interesting how not even just you know, I know that you said it's very flat and it, it doesn't quite work. I, I think a couple of the action sequences are okay. I quite like the, the one in the Middle East with the trucks. I think that one works relatively well, better than any of the other ones. But uh, listeners cannot see, but Jack is uh, sighing. Oh, visibly. His eyes well, are sighing. Let's then, I, I like, to me, that was all I wanted to talk okay. about spoiler free. And all so right. I'm ready to go into the spoiler right. zone if you are. I'm ready. Let's go. Let's do this. Okay. Thing. Air horn. <laughs> burr, burr, burr. Welcome to the spoiler zone. Zone, zone, zone. 
uh, this. Wow, this how do you do the post production on this? This is amazing. Um, <laughs> so, and it's amazing because I can hear the post production even as I'm live. It's astounding. It's welcome to the spoiler zone. zone, zone, zone. <laughs> <laughs> Just physically move further away <laughs> from the microphone. Uh, so, uh, yes, heads up, everyone. We are, are that, not going to be. That is Jack's audition to be action director of Wonder Woman 3. I can do it, Patty. Call me up. I, You know what I'll do? I'll just hire someone <laughs> who's actually competent at uh, directing action sequences. Um, but you can you can pay I, me to hire someone else if I, you'd like. I love the idea of, of Zack Snyder working for Jack. I think that's kind of beautiful. I want that. I want that. I want Jack being like Zach. These these dailies, they're not they're not it. They're not they're in. Not. We we don't we don't need this shot. This shot. This shot. Why is it set in a hallway? Um. Uh, anyway, here's a medium talk- shot, Zach. I want you to work on it. I want you to memorize it, and I want you to start using it. <laughs> Sorry, that was mean. no. That's fine. Uh, that's fair. That's fine and fair. We are about to spoil uh, Wonder Woman eighty four. Nothing is off limits after. I'm done warning you. Uh, so for anyone who uh, listened, watched, and now want to turn away, thank you so much yeah, for doing you. so. And have a happy new year. Happy new year. Oh, no. Uh, you've oh, had, had a happy new year. Apologies. You've hopefully ah. had a happy new Welcome year. Welcome to 2021. 20, 20, 20, 21. You did it. You did it. You made it. Uh, okay. Spoiler. Action. There is an action sequence that takes place in Egypt um, with many trucks and like the reason why I call it flat is like there there there's no tension, like there's no break points in the action sequences. Spe- thinking specifically of this one with the trucks, right? Like she's yeah. What what's her end goal in in that action sequence? To get Lord, right? To apprehend Lord. Is it? Because she was right on top of him and just was yelling at him. She didn't like grab him out of the truck or anything. The her I mean, motive... he did also suggest he had transformed himself into a magic stone, which does give a lot of people pause. I mean, in the, in the middle of an action scene, even I would be like, "Wait, what?" <laughs> I I what I what I feel like is the and action is hard, and especially on superhero scale, keeping track of a lot of moving parts is hard, but. It was difficult for me to understand Wonder Woman's relation to anything or even her objective at the end of the action sequence, specifically in that truck one. All she like she drove up next to Lord was yelling at him. Then then she actioned through all the tanks and got to him, but uh, then fell off. I actually forget how that one ends, but she falls off. She falls off and then a bunch of kids get in danger and she saves a bunch of kids. Oh, that's right. She saved a bunch of kids. I, I love that. I love that we're like, we're like, oh god! If only she didn't save those kids. Damn it! Um, <laughs> but um, what I would say, actually, to to speak in defense of that sequence, it does something that I actually quite like, which is it does this weird visual storytelling thing where earlier in the movie you have seen Wonder Woman as a child in the introductory sequence, which is completely superfluous. But hey, it's a superhero movie, so why the hell not? Uh, where you have her learn the important lesson about not taking shortcuts, because I wonder if that might be thematically relevant, and we'll come back to that in a second. But she does this, yeah, it's it's about cheating, um, and the idea that wishing is cheating, and and people are taking shortcuts by wishing. Is oh, don't worry. The theme? I, I, <laughs> oh, don't worry. I have a whole section titled "It's the Economy, Stupid." Um, <laughs> No, no, like, like, really, Wonder Woman 1984 is it's the economy stupid as a superhero movie. But we'll come back to that one. Okay, so, um, yeah, yeah. But, like, so you have the, like, and I really, really, like, I, ge- I, I know we're kind of joking, but I genuinely love it. The opening sequence has the moment where she runs through the obstacle course, and you have the pendulum type thing that swings around, and she leverages that to kind of jump. And then later yeah. on, you have that repeated with the truck flip in the action sequence on the road. Where and again, it's it's that taking of the Dark Knight thing where she uses that and she leverages and she flips over and you have like again throughout the movie you have this theme that everything comes at a cost and for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction and sometimes those things are unintentional. Um, you know, again, the, the, what we call the Breaking Bad morality, but you know, not as as good or as tight or as well constructed. But we'll come back to that. But like, even in the action sequences, you have this idea that there are consequences from things hitting other things, which I quite like in superhero movies because I quite like the idea that when you hit something, it moves and it hits something else. So you have mm. like the launching of the rocket in order to propel her, and then it's like, oh wait, that rocket might hit something, so I have to get rid of it. That sort of stuff. 
Okay, um, sure, sure. And the idea of her swinging and her landing with the kids, but landing in the middle of the road again. And again, mm -hmm. you have this kind of stuff that happens throughout, which I think, you know, which kind of fits with this idea of there being unintended consequences even in that action scene. Like nobody in that action scene intends to hurt those kids, for example, even though mm -hmm. they're playing in the middle of the road. But because they're having a big, stupid superhero movie action car chase, those kids might get hurt. So somebody has to do something to stop them. And you have mm -hmm. this kind of constant perpetual physics thing where trucks are being flipped or she's bouncing from one truck to the other. And she's using physics in a way that I find interesting. And I mean, I know that it's not the best superhero action movie ever. It's nothing. It's not at all a no man's land sequence. But I, I admire what it kind of did conceptually. Um, if that makes sense. Oh, no. And I like what I what I feel is that like a lot of my issues as far as thinking that it's flat can be fixed in editing where where it's like a little more setup time, maybe even a little more payoff time. Uh, like it's just like the camera cuts on yeah. the wrong parts. Like yeah. I think that a few more close ups, the, for example, a reaction. Shot, like just a sort of couple stuff. more yeah. close ups. Yeah. Uh, but the the rocket propel thing, which was, yes, a very neat thing. Chris Pine like shows he shows like he shows the rocket, not the launcher, just the <laughs> yeah. rocket. Yeah. He shows the rocket, sets it besides and, him and, and fires it. And somehow. nobody complains that he knows how to use a 1984 rocket launcher. Everyone's all like, oh, it's a problem that a pilot can fly a jet from 1984. But all of a sudden he's using a rocket launcher and everyone's like, it's no big deal. I mean, come so on, people, pick your battles. He, um, he sets the rocket down, fires it off. Wonder Woman lassos onto it, propels herself yeah. to the next truck, which is great. But like, I I would have loved a little more time on like you know like a him a looking around up. frantically to find what something. can I yeah, do yeah. to help? Oh, yeah. here's a rocket launcher. Like, okay, set up. Now <laughs> yeah. I'm ready for that payoff. But instead, we hey, I got this. <laughs> there it goes. <laughs> Uh, um, speaking of particularly bad effects, uh, when she grabs the children off of the street, uh, a stunt double is rolling with them and they are clearly wooden dummies. Uh, it, it's really Damn bad. Damn those child labor laws. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just a, a rubber dummy so their arms could flap around or something. But, you know, like she's holding on yeah. to two children like this. Yeah. It, um, yeah, it's just it, it wasn't. It it wasn't the action I was looking for, and coming from the same team that brought us the first Wonder Woman, that was what was very that's what was extra disappointing to yeah. me. Is like, oh, I know you've given me something very yeah. special as far as action is concerned. Yeah, and and to, this is one of those things where again, it is both a compliment and an insult. It is both praise mm -hmm. and criticism. Is that the climax of the movie? And we'll talk maybe oh, specifically about the mechanics of the climax of the movie later on. But the mm. climax of the movie gives you this, again, completely superfluous and pointless action sequence with Diana and Cheetah. Because, like, there's a sense that, well, there has to be a, a third act action sequence, right? But then it goes down to the confrontation between Diana and Max Lord. Mm. And it's just two people shouting at each other over a wind machine. And it doesn't work. Let's be clear. It does not work. But I kind of admire that it's like, let's try and do a superhero movie that doesn't have a big CGI. Uh, what was it? One of my one of my colleagues uh, <laughs> referred to um, the de use of David Lewis. And again, I like Wonder Woman. I did it, the original Wonder Woman. And I actually have a like ironic soft spot for that final act in large part because David Thewlis, like CGI ripped David Thewlis. Tell me that that's not what you want from superhero blockbuster cinema. Tell me that like the entire genre isn't enriched by the fact that like the old creepy dude from Fargo season three is like the living God of war. One of my colleagues Ryan. described him as was it Savile Row Magneto was basically the third act of uh, Wonder Woman. And it's a great description. And I understand that that is why people hate it, but that is also why, to be frank, I kind of love it. But seeing like <laughs> Professor Lupin all jacked up <laughs> yeah. was hilarious. Yeah. Yes, objectively, it's yeah. hilarious out but of context. Like a great. bowler hat, and he almost uh, did. He have an umbrella at one point, or am I just misremembering Doctor Who? Seventies Doctor Who. <laughs> but yeah, like that sort of mood. Like I kind of love that the movie just went there. It's like, well, we need to have a CGI third act. It's like, well, what do we got? We got a British character actor, and he's wearing a suit. Let's go with it. That's that's, that's all we need. Um, Michael like, Fassbender know, makes this look easy. <laughs> I know the themes of the movie have already wrapped up, but we still need someone to punch someone else. Yeah, through some CGI stuff. Can we do that? Um, and like, you know, we, we like if you if you put a gun to my head and I had to choose like 
CGI robot James Spader punching people through things, or CGI whatever the hell that was in Batman vs. Superman Doomsday punching people through things, or veteran British character actor David Thewlis punching people through things. I'm always going to pick veteran British character <laughs> actor David Thewlis punching people through things. Um, While that's funnier, I mean, who can't have more David Spader? Even if it's in oh, robot form, I'll take more David Spader. James Spader, not David Spader. James Spader. Oh, that's, no, a very, oh. that's a very different um, Age of Ultra. Yeah. Sorry, oh. my Transformer brain was mushing two things together. <laughs> oh, now I'm imagining Age of Ultron, but with, with David Spader in the Ultron role. With David, David Spade. <laughs> David Spade. With David Spade, yes. uh, Tony Stark sitting there wondering, what have I created? Um, but, um, but like, and, and we mentioned this earlier on, like, the, the large part of the reaction against Wonder Woman, the, like, people generally liked the first Wonder Woman, but the big criticism was, oh, but we don't need CGI David Thewlis punching people through stuff. And I'm like, right. sure, that's fine. That's your choice. You, everybody's mm -hmm. entitled to their opinion, and that's fine. Um, but I like that the studio was like, okay, let's actually try and do this and create a big blockbuster superhero movie that doesn't involve a climax of people punching each other through CGI things. You get a little taste of it with, like, Cheetah, but, like, for mm -hmm. a solid 20 minutes at the end, nobody is punching nobody through nothing. And it's like, this doesn't work, but I admire that you really committed to it. You, you try, like, <laughs> well, and it doesn't work because it doesn't work. Like they, the, uh, I guess like this, this is a good part. This is a good chance to talk about the themes of the movie, how they, how they are set up, how they are concluded and the big old mess of it all. Because Yes, this could work. In, in fact, if, if you take Wonder Woman 1, just lop off that fight, it works. Like, the theme is wrapped up. She learns about the gray morality of man and war and, you know, chooses to fight on uh, for goodness sake. That's it. You just need to shoop, shoop, snip off yeah. that fight and you're good to go. Or just, just have, like, David Thewlis sitting in a deck chair while Chris Pine is sacrificing himself. That's all you have to do. Exactly. But here, the way that they try to wrap up the themes, oh, so muddled. Every, just, just, just everything. So it's like, where do you even, <laughs> where do you even start? Because like, for me, the theme of the movie is never clearly established. Like what the movie is trying to say is never really there. You can't get something for nothing, basically. It's the economy, sure. stupid. Everything has a price or a value. No, like, literally, literally, in the most boring sense imaginable, it is basically, like, market economics, the superhero movie, where the core concept, and, like, and, like, it's not subtle about it at all. The core concept of it is you want something and you pay for it. And if you attempt to avoid paying for it, there are consequences. And the main mm -hmm. character, the, the villain of the piece, Max Lord, is a businessman. And again, this is one of the things where I'm like, Am I going galaxy brain? I think I'm going galaxy brain. But um, the core theme of it is, you know, obviously set in the 1980s, around the time that movies like Wall Street would be, you know, were released and, you know, the, around the time that, say, The Wolf of Wall Street, some of that would have taken place. And that kind of trading that we associate with the 80s, where yeah. you move beyond the idea of things having, like, fixed absolute values. And obviously, you know, this goes back to, like, you know, the stock market and the 1929, the Great Depression. This has always been a thing. But you would argue that particularly since the late 80s, when Wall Street really roared to life in its current form, you mm. had this idea of divorcing substance from reality. This idea that mm. you can get something for nothing. And the idea that if you screw up, you'll just get bailed out and there will be no consequences for you whatsoever. And the idea that you can avoid debt or that you could be in massive debt and still present yourself as a successful businessman because you don't actually have to pay for anything you own because all your value is abstract. It's not liquid. It's not material. It's not in okay. bricks and mortars. It's in this kind of a abstract idea of how much you're worth. And so, and again, this ties into who Max Lord is clearly meant to be, uh, which I don't think is entirely subtle at all, uh, even before God. you get to the bedwetting, bathing in a golden shower and tied by a golden thread metaphor, which I thought was maybe a little bit much, but hey, let, let's face it, that's about right. But uh, Or he turns himself into a giant orange inanimate object, which is also a representative of the end times. But also, I thought maybe that was also a bit much, but we won't go too much into that. But the idea uh. that, like, Max Lord spends the entire movie trying desperately to stay ahead of his creditors um, mm. and basically maneuvering 
swapping one deal for another, for another, for another in order to get further along and never settling or paying the price. He's always trying to stay one step ahead of the cost that's accrued to basically what he's doing. Okay, all right, I'm with you. And everybody else in the movie is basically doing the same thing. They want a wish. They want something granted and they want to get something for nothing because nobody makes the deal. Nobody knows the price of what they're getting. So, you know, Mm -hmm. when Diana says, you know, when Diana thinks to herself, I want Steve back, she never says, yes, but I will pay my powers to get that back, for example. When Barbara says, hey, I would like to be like Diana, she doesn't think, yes, but I would sacrifice my humanity for that. And it isn't until it's gone that you realize. And so you have this idea that once all this happens, all the unintended consequences that accrue because nothing has value anymore. So, hey, you want to be a farmer, you wish for cows. All of a sudden, cows are grazing on city land because you didn't put any thought to it, it, because you didn't think of the material value of it. And so it kind of builds and it accrues, and basically you have this chain of deals, which is similar to a Ponzi scheme, where you're all building on this idea that something at the base of this has value. And so Mm. you just keep funneling up, funneling up value and wealth and material value and stuff like that, and hope that it all comes together, and it doesn't really. And again, this is where you get to the who Max Lord is meant to be, which is obviously Donald Trump. But the of idea course. that you have a president of the United States who has marketed himself as a billionaire uh, for decades, uh, but mm-hmm. is also in massive financial debt, um, has paid, I think, a grand total of seven hundred euro, seven hundred dollars in taxes uh, because yeah. he has so little <laughs> actual material value, but has yes. managed to present himself as wealthy, successful um, and managed to ride that all the way to the top and has done mm. so by making promises that he cannot keep to people that have followed him. And again, this is the thing where the movie's metaphor is, if we're being charitable, let's be charitable, let's be charitable. Let's let's say the movie's metaphor is hopelessly naive and optimistic, okay, where great. it accepts at face value the idea that people who invested in what this huckster was offering were doing so in the belief that he would be able to realize their dreams that he would be able to in particular in the case of wonder woman 1984 bring back things that were gone that were dead like say steve trevor's but also like say uh, steel industries um that sort of thing that he could resurrect these that he could you know make america great again as it were and kind of like sure. restore us to a nostalgic idealized lost past uh-huh. And the idea of Wonder Woman 94 is that once people realize that, no, that's impossible, that doesn't actually happen, and you wishing for that has a terrible cost, people will sanely, in their own minds, go, yeah, I never really thought about how much what I was wishing for was hurting other people. I never thought that me throwing my lot in with this idea and this ideology would have consequences mm. that would negatively affect like my fellow human beings. Now that I see that, I'm going to renounce that, and I'm, I'm going to accept that I was wrong to want it in the first place. And it's not that bad because I didn't want to hurt anybody, is it? Right. Yeah. And so, like... but the the issue and the the reason why I had such a hard time pinning down the theme is we start to get to Diana fixing everything, right? Which she fixes with an impassioned speech, with the power of truth, as she is using yeah. the power of information. And, uh, you know, the the core mechanic as far as like fixing the world is everyone who made a wish Renounces has it. to renounce their wish, which Diana has already done. But like we get to someone like like Cheetah, who has renounced her wish because we cut back to her and she is. And the sun is rising again. metaphorically. Yeah. But why? Yeah. No, that that's it. That's that's the movie. That's like that's that is the part of the movie that I find hopelessly naive and optimistic, which is the movie's logic. And again, I think the movie is internally consistent. You ask why, and the answer is for the same reason that those armed robbers at the start were like, "Whoa, whoa, 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 whoa! Don't hurt the kid. That's not what we're here for." Uh, sure. Sure, I meant to rob that jewelry place. I did not mean to place a kid in danger. The moment I realized that I placed the kid in danger, I would have renounced my jewelry robbing days. Like, and it's a consistent, no, but it, it's a consistent through line through the movie. And it is hopelessly and unapologetically naive. Like, the movie's Ronald Reagan character, right? Let, let's just focus on that, right? Let's sure, ignore the sure. let's ignore the Middle East stuff, right? Where like the Middle East stuff is perhaps. Oh, stuff we're that... gonna get to the Middle East stuff. Okay, right. okay, but like stuff that I feel more comfortable talking about as somebody who knows like the history and politics involved, like the nuclear deterrent, where 
Ronald Reagan, who is played by Stuart Milligan, who is an actor who played Richard Nixon on Doctor Who, which is nice that those two presidents are now linked in pop cultural consciousness. But anyway, um, so he is like, well, I just wish for more nukes because that will scare the Russians into acknowledging how great we are and we can have world peace. And it's right. like nobody, nobody who has ever been elected president of the United States is that stupid. Like nobody. Like No, no, no. Even that guy. Even, <laughs> even, even that guy. Whoever you're thinking of. I'm not going to say who it is, but even that guy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're right. Warren G. Harding. Even Warren G. Harding would know. But, but even okay. So like even. But like yeah, like it's, it's, e- even let's let's say he's that stupid, right? <laughs> let's say a president is that stupid, and they wish for more nukes, and it starts. Uh, it starts the 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 mutually, mutually assured, assured destruction, 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 right? All the nukes are flying everywhere. Then Wonder Woman, through her power of truth gets gets president uh uh not nixon, reagan yeah <laughs> president not reagan sorry uh mixing up my actors now to recant his wish but how <laughs> the movie like like you you called it fairy yeah. tale logic and that's all fine but there are some cases like when you are wrapping <laughs> up the theme to your movie that you need to show your freaking math <laughs> and none of it is shown <laughs> Not even for Pedro Pascal, who is reminded that he has a child who we've known about for a long time. He spent a lot of scenes with, but all of a sudden is reminded that he has a child and renounces his wish. None of the math is shown for why the theme wraps up, which is why I was so confused on what the theme was in general. Because in the end, Wonder Woman makes a speech and everything is fixed. Yeah, because people are rational and logical in the world of Wonder Woman 1984. Because you can reason with them. Uh, and because they, like, like, there's the moment where, like, the, the Irish guy is like, and I wish you drop dead. And she, she yeah. does. And he's like, well, I never meant it literally. So we're all A-OK. Like, like, my question is, what do you think the world of Wonder Woman 1984 is like 20 minutes after the movie? Like, the, the the logic of the movie is quite clear. Everybody just says, well, look, everybody makes mistakes. Let's shake hands. Let's get over it. Let's move on with yeah. our lives. But in the real world, if you're like, well, some Egyptian sheik uh, wished that a giant wall would be erected in the middle of Egypt. Um, so we're going to have to deal with that um, and the consequences of that and everything mm-hmm. that accrues from that. So uh, also, we assume the wall disappeared because the nukes disappeared. Did the buildings it destroyed get reconstructed? Yeah. We don't know. Well, you see the water coming in, which implies that they didn't. Because the like the key thing is, and like again, it's all fairy tale logic. Because like the the thing with the wall is, you know, not oh well, the USSR is planning to nuke them. Um, the thing with the wall is, well, actually, they've cut off water flowing in, so all the people are really thirsty. So mm. when he renounces his wish. The wall collapses and water rushes in because magically that's what restores the wish. It's the same thing with the president, where the president's like, I renounce my wish. And it's like, okay, fine. That explains why all the US nukes disappeared. But what about the nukes the Russians have launched, which I presume they did not wish for? Um, Those aren't No, they just just launched (laughs) them. They just launched them. They they just launched them. But those are the ones we see disappearing, not the American (laughs) ones. Yeah, you have to assume that the, the logic, again, it's fairy tale logic, which is like, oh, but the wishing stone knows what you meant in your heart, man. And it's able to, like, restore and balance in such a way that it all, can, like, it's, it's the same thing when Pedro Pascal is like, you know, and in return, you will be removed from my path forever. And it's like, we are an, an audit team and we're just showing up to audit him and make sure that he is removed from your path forever. Um, That sort of stuff. Where, like, I, I don't actually mind that much that stuff too much because that's all magic like that that's all like there's a magic, w- magic it is that's all like there's a wishing stone and the wishing stone works according to its own logic and you just have to mm. go with it it's like the force in star wars it's like sure the force can heal things now because i don't know why not i guess sure yeah let's, yeah, let's yeah. just go with it it's like sure the magic wishing stone can make nukes that aren't yours disappear in midair we'll assume that it also makes like the the, the indictment charges against simon stag disappear because otherwise you got a really bum deal um <laughs> but like <laughs> but like that stuff is fine it's it's more the kind of like mm. the human essence stuff where it's like do you imagine for a moment that the people whose, as you pointed out, houses were destroyed by that wall 
are not going to want to like grab guns or grab sharp objects or mm -hmm. like attempt to avenge themselves the, or to take something back. The Irish that were being hauled away yeah. in cop cars when the <laughs> one woman wished that all the Irish would go back to where they came from, all of a sudden yeah, wake up in a police cool. station yeah. and go, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, you're letting me out now, but why was I in yeah, here? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Uh, magic. Yeah. Or or was is it was that like their version of the purge <laughs> where everyone was like, nope, magic. Honey, I know I cheated on you, but that was during the wish thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was a little bit before. It was it was, oh, it was very complicated. Kind of during it overlapped, but uh... yeah, magic, magic, magic. Yeah, I do. I do love and everyone just agreed that for that like forty eight hour period, like eh, we're just gonna nothing counted. <laughs> which which like, I guess... <laughs> We were on a break, says mankind to reality. Um, like, and again, I don't like. I need, I need to be clear. It's not the plot mechanics I have a problem with, because like they're part no. and parcel with going with it. It's the, like it's the sure. basic human biology, like human psychology of it, which is like mm. if I wake up in a prison cell because somebody wished me to be there, I'm not gonna be like, well, look, everybody makes mistakes. It's like we need to have a conversation about you, your attitude towards me. I didn't know you thought of me like that. Um, this right? is, yeah, this is like we're going to have a serious HR meeting after this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, and I think like that that kind of wibbly wobbliness also now I want to delve into something we alluded to earlier, which is it's okay just to have the bad guy be bad. Yeah. Like I understand that they are they are going for a different stride here. They are going for a uh, a well-rounded villain, a perhaps even uh, sympathetic villain. Like, I would argue the character who appears in this movie is somehow more rounded and three-dimensional than the character in real life on which he's modeled on. I, I would I would 100% agree with you. Like, he, he, has, a, he has a past. Uh, he has a future. He has a child, uh, adopted or not. I don't know how that works. I think it's his ex-wife. I think they, I think it is his biological, but I think it's. it's... I want to say somewhere. Oh, I, yeah. I I remember hearing that it was his adopted oh, son. Yeah. But he, but you know, it doesn't matter. He has a child who he seems to genuinely Love. care for when you know not businessing. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it, how it's many a weekends do I have? Um... Exactly. <laughs> The, the amount of time. If only you were a that... wishing stone and could wish for more weekends, um, Max. Like that kid overhears his dad like <laughs> talk smack about him a lot, is all I'm saying. And so it's like we we have our final confrontation with the big bad guy, who and a wind then, machine, and a wind machine can't for you can't forget the wind machine. It does a dad. lot of heavy lifting. And then Wonder Woman gives the speech. Everything's good. Uh, everything goes back to normal. Everything goes back to Happy Town. What's really nice is that he was still able to take the president's helicopter back to DC. I, I love that touch. I actually love the touch of like, sure, we'll drop you off. Marine One will drop you off. We're on the way back anyway, right? Um, we're gonna we're gonna drop you off. You know so you renounced your wish. You know that we, like you've renounced your wish, so you no longer have the power of the presidency. Was it the yeah. the the respect that you command? Mm. and the command Ooh. yeah and the command yes. of others respect and it's like that's not really a nice word play there i know you use the two words twice but uh yeah. as a super villain you might want to work on that fear leads to hate hate leads to anger anger leads to fear something like that uh the so but the what the point is and and very similarly with Kristen wiggs character and the wish right which is like we we are set up a, a very standard like jealousy turns into hate character arc villain turn if you will heel turn um for K Kristen Wiig and Cheetah which is perfectly fine for a, for a heel turn like she's very jealous of Diana that jealousy It is morphs. literally a heel turn given that you know I mean she does point out that she likes Diana's heels It's a high heel yeah. turn is the way that pun should Sorry. have worked No no I think that's uh, you should have said it earlier that's yeah. the only thing you need to apologize for um but the reason that she is a villain, as it turns out, is because of the magic, not because she's a bad guy. And and so I, I I don't know. Let me have a bad guy. Like it's okay. I want the hero to punch the bad guy in the end, and I want <laughs> I want the bad guy also to have repercussions. Like I want Pedro Pascal to pay a price for his villainy. That's why he's the villain. But no, 
everything's fine. Kristen Wiig, she's stuck on an island, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> she's fine. Like, I, it's a superhero movie. Yeah. Part of that means the good guy wins, the bad guy loses, and has repercussions for losing. I, I admire that it tries not to do that. Like, I admire that it tries something different, even if it doesn't get it to work. Oh, oh fine. Bah, 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 bah. Bah, oh, trying to... Bah, bah. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. We're trying to revolutionize it's comic books, which have been around for a hundred <laughs> freaking years. <laughs> it's trying to revolution. It's trying to tweak a little bit. Like, ah. a little bit. It's a little tiny tweak, and it's just one movie. I feel like you can get away with it. But anyway, my... my yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, you should do it well, is my, my criticism. My criticism oh, okay. is that you should do it better. Um, but I mean, you know, I don't fault them for trying to do that. And I think, hmm. I think yeah, I think you're right. Is that, like, it is a big problem that nobody is wrong. Which is, like, like <laughs> and I, I mean, it's it's really odd because... That's it. And again, this, we'll probably talk a little bit about the internet reaction to this. Because the internet reaction to this hmm. has been very, very strange. But it's, like, hmm. it's a very strange thing. And I don't think, like, you know, like... This is one of the things where, like, pop culture... Have I changed or has pop culture changed over the past, like, five or six years? But, mm. like, I remember when I would watch movies during the 90s. And I would watch movies like, say, Crimson Tide, to pick an example. And sure. Crimson Tide is a really, really good movie. Uh, like most Tony mm. Scott movies, it's really good, it's really fun, it's really well written. However, mm. there's a bit at the climax where... And again, light spoiler description. But, like, the core plot of the movie is that Denzel Washington and Gene Hackman are fighting over whether or not to launch a bunch of nukes. And, you know, that there's kind of, like, a coup on a ship and there's, like, a battle back and forth between them. Very good. Mm -hmm. If you haven't seen it, watch it. But there's a moment towards yes, the climax uh, where the two of them sit down to have a conversation together. I think it's while the crew are voting or something like that. And it's a moment where the two characters, like, get to talk face to face. And, like, in the middle of that sequence, Gene Hackman just drops a whole bunch of racist crap. And I remember when I watched it, because he, he's talking about horses, and it's he's not talking about horses, but he's talking about horses, if you get my meaning. And I remember when I watched that in the 90s, oh. I was like, um, wow, that was a turn. I did not need for that man to suddenly become horrifically racist when talking to Denzel Washington. <laughs> that was a bit of a left swerve, <laughs> out of nowhere. And mm -hmm. I wonder now, today, I'd be like, yeah, that kind of fits. Dude is randomly racist for no reason whatsoever. Because that's just the world in which we live now. Um, and I wonder if, like, if Wonder Woman 1984 had come out maybe five years ago or six years ago, I'd mm. be like, it's really great that they're trying to make a superhero movie where nobody's wrong. Everybody's just misunderstood. Nobody is, is trying to hurt anybody else. Nobody wants to cause problems. All the characters need to do is just, like, listen to each other and, and talk to one another. And, and if they do... They'll, they'll magically agree with one another because everybody's reasonable. Like, that's great. And I wonder if that had been, if this movie even released five years ago, I'd be like, this is brilliant. This is radical. I like, really love this. This is fantastic. But because of the five years we've just lived through, I'm like, hmm. you hopelessly, hopelessly naive movie. What? What are you thinking? Like, I, I guess like, like you said, it's it's also just not done very yeah. well, which is which is really the heart of it, which is like like, yes, I, I, I can be with you in applauding the attempt. But also like, listen, these are action movies. These, you know, the best comic book movie is a good action sci fi movie. That's that's it. Like, that's all we're looking for here. We're <laughs> You know, we're not we're not trying to bring that much art house cinema into this. We need Maybe you're guy. not, Jack. We need a bad guy. <laughs> I'm really looking I'm... forward to Werner Herzog's Flash movie. Thank you very much. Oh, first of all, day one, I'm there. <laughs> I am so I'm buying 10 tickets just for me. <laughs> I just love that man as a man and as a yeah. director. So, yes. Um, uh, 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 Sorry. No, no, I, I think it's, it's, it, it's, it's a problem with uh, a lot of this movie, which is a lot of it feels unfinished and unpolished there. There, you know, it's a, yeah. it's a very long movie. The action sequences aren't quite there. And the, are very far the, spaced apart as well in terms of length as oof, well. Oof, baby. Um, and, and really like the story isn't tight it is not knit well together uh, how much of that is because they didn't really have audience reactions to gauge you know responses right usually a, a film like this uh, gets a lot of preview screenings. And test screenings you could tell when people cheer when people don't cheer what to slow up exactly. what to tighten what to loosen 
um, how much of that is because it's on a streaming service and they don't re need to worry about length because you can pause it at any moment to go to the bathrooms. We had three bathroom breaks during Wonder Woman 84, well, by the way, but I was watching it with my family, so, you know. Hi. Right. Where were your breaks? <laughs> Where were your commercial breaks? Uh, they, oh, they weren't planned. It oh, was okay. just when we, oh, okay. when we had to go to oh, the bathroom. Okay. But I'll, what I'll tell you this is no one ever complained when we paused it. <laughs> um... So, yeah, it's just it, it feels like it needed a little more time in the oven or a little more thought into its cohesive structure. There's there's one last bit that I want to really dive into. And I know we're already at oh, close to an hour and a half. Sorry, guys. But, sorry, but also not sorry. Fair Happy point. New Year. <laughs> uh, there, there's one there's one point that I really want to dive into, which is. Everything comes at a cost. The 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 whole uh, apparently the theme of the movie. I think Darren, you you are correct. Is that every action has a reaction? Decisions have consequences, although sometimes unintended. Yeah. Let's talk about the handsome man. Yes. The man I who gets have... properly Lois Laned, probably like Superman yes. Two Lois Laned. Yes, I have a big problem with diana's cost because i had thought it was going one direction and then it was never brought up which is obviously we're in spoiler <laughs> town here so diana wishes to have um chris pine back alive yeah. chris pine is back alive but it's just his consciousness inside someone credited as handsome, handsome man, man who <laughs> when compared with, i mean he might be handsome but compared to chris pine come on first of all Maybe he's not my cup of tea. Chris Pine is, but he... <laughs> human man. Human. He's human man. And so we get this weird sequence in which handsome man, a different actor, is talking to Diana and trying to convince her that he's Steve. And then we see it through Diana's vision where he is Chris Pine. Then after, after uh, this is just a setup, I guess, if you're watching this uh, without or if you're listening to this without watching the movie. At the end, uh, Diana renounces her wish. Handsome Man returns to the consciousness of Handsome Man. Chris Pine is gone forever. Now, that that sets up a really interesting morality, which is Diana's wish was to have Steve back. The cost of that wish was literally killing the Handsome Man. Uh, I love that, that we call him the handsome man. I mean, like it's, well, it's I, that's I, what, I know no, it's that's what he's credited. I know, as. but it's it, like sentences like the cost of that was killing the handsome man. Um, <laughs> it makes it sound like kind of like a Mills and Boone kind of like a proper super yeah. like sort of. You must kill <laughs> the handsome, handsome man. man. <laughs> Went Sean Connery for some reason. Um, but the fact that they have displaced the handsome man's consciousness, essentially killing him is yeah. not mentioned even in a passing phrase her cost was losing her superpowers <laughs> now both my wife and i during one of our pause breaks were like wait a minute i thought the cost was going to be are we okay killing this other guy to bring you back oh i'm the hero i'm definitely not okay with that yeah. that's going to be like the big bounce never brought up yeah the answer is yes the answer is yes we are perfectly okay with that um, yeah, no, that, that's the thing. Is that like, and again, this is the like naivety of the movie. If we're being very charitable, which is that it never thinks through any of the consequences, or it never looks at any of the consequences of what its characters do in any sense beyond. Well, look, they really, really want it, and you've always, you really, really want stuff too. Surely you can understand it. And like, to to bring it back to the Chris Pine stuff, actually, just very quickly, I think yeah. I really like that aspect of it, which is the movie kind of makes us a little bit complicit in that because we're like. Hey, we like having Chris Pine back too. So yeah, we're we we're happy. Yeah, we do. We really, really do. So we can understand why Diana wants him back because we're like, yeah, we want him in our Wonder Woman movie. But the fact that it never brings up like the handsome man or what happens with him is a problem. And it's the same yeah. problem that you encounter with, say, um, Barbara's like turn to evil um, when she like beats the crap out of the guy who assaulted her, which is a very thorny issue because it gets into all manner of stuff around the idea of, you know, well, at what point are we comfortable with beating up sexual predators or sexual harassers? At what point is that cathartic? And at what point do we as an audience become complicit in that catharsis becoming ugly and unpleasant? And at what point does it, you know, is is it, how comfortable are we with it? Is it okay? Is there a point where it stops being okay? 
is it was it never okay to begin with and these are all complicated questions these are basically right. like you should be watching promising young woman instead um it's basically right, like the right, subtext right. of this but the movie's like no 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 no. It's, it's it's really simple all we're doing here is just showing you that she has power now and she needs to learn to be careful with it because she might take it a little bit too far and it's like I feel like that's a very simplified um, breakdown of everything that's happening in this scene. I feel but, like... But also, also, like, that wasn't really the character moment of the scene. The character moment of that scene wasn't her beating the crap out of that guy. It was the fact that she was mean to her homeless friend. Yeah. Like, the... <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, like, again, it's, it's that weird sense of, like, and that's... The, and the character moment in that scene is her realizing, wait, is this the person I want to be kind of thing? Because, like, at that point, she's still helping Diana. And at that point, Diana's still like, yeah, you know, maybe Barbara has a point. Maybe we don't have to renounce our wishes. Because I like having Chris Pine back in the movie. And I haven't put mm -hmm. any thought about Handsome Man whatsoever. Um, And, like, I, it is a massive problem with the movie that is, as you point out, as I, as I argued, about consequences, about price, about the idea that everything comes at a cost, that the mm -hmm. movie never thinks about what that cost is for people who are not the people that we care about, the people who are the nominal main characters. Everything mm -hmm. is incidental. Everything around them exists in abstract terms. It is a cardboard world, to quote, again, to make a reference to a superhero cartoon, to bring it all full circle. It is a world made of cardboard. A, a quick shout out to Handsome Man. He's played by Christopher Paloa, actually, who is a Hallmark Channel regular. Um, so, you know, I mean, I reckon he's, he's probably quite happy to be here. I I And you know what? I, and I do apologize. Uh, like, he is handsome, <laughs> yes. Uh, he, he is a handsome man. He, that is a correct credit. I'm just saying compared to com you start comparing yourself to Chris Pine. like you know, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And, I, and I mean, like the fact that they take his body on a joyride as well is a little bit uncomfortable as well, where it's like and I mean, like, and this is the yeah. thing where you have the kind of the double standard as well, where it's like, is it like, are we as an audience more comfortable with it? Because she's she's a woman. I, like if, if it had been the reverse and it had been him having sex with a woman who Diana had hopped into we would probably be more uncomfortable with it. And what does that say mm. about us and the movie and the assumptions that go with it? And the film is like, no, 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 no. Don't, don't worry about it. That, that, well, that's a... And I, like, I've seen that floating around the internet yeah. about, about like, you know, ba basically uh, Di Diana has raped this man yeah. because he has had sex. But, but here's the thing. Is it still rape if he's dead? Because he is dead. And I feel like killing him Ranks high. is a step above. Okay, here's a question. So, so what you're saying is that it, it is basically, um, yeah, okay, sex with a dead body, basically, necrophilia. It, it, she's having sex with a dead body at this point, and, and more importantly, she killed him. Not intentionally. Doesn't matter. Doesn't doesn't matter. <laughs> Manslaughter's still killing. Like, <laughs> she killed him, and like, it's like yes, they're, they're like... I suppose technically, yes, she is also raping him. But to me, the higher, <laughs> the the bigger thing here is before that she murdered him. So it's like, I, you know, <laughs> you, you know. I mean, we talk about how Zack Snyder movies are dark, Jack. But you just pitched Wonder Woman 1984 as like the darkest Jack, Zack Snyder edge lord fantasy. Tell tell me, it's I'm like, incorrect yeah. in anything. Like, remember I just that said. interview where he was like, "In my." No, no, I'm not, I'm not saying you are. I'm just remarking that, like, you've just basically turned Wonder Woman 1984 into that interview where Zack Snyder's like, yeah, but my Batman movie would be like, and I'm not going to tell you what it'd be like. You can Google search and it'll be a surprise to you. Um, <laughs> this, this is my, like, this, that was like a big sticking point for me is when they decided they didn't care about the handsome man especially for a movie that's all about like oh. harsh morality and truth telling and Come. consequences. Like the fact that this is just flown off. We do get a, you know, the part of the, the lovely wintry scene because this movie was definitely supposed to come out in Christmas was a, a little recap with her and handsome man where, where, you know, may, maybe they'll start something. I mean, she already knows how, how good he, how good he is in certain areas. And so it's like, we get it like a, a comfy, cozy little wrap up. And Christopher Palua clears his schedule for the next five years because he's going to be in the Wonder Woman franchise. It's like, yeah, it's great. Yeah, I mean, that's fine. I'm really happy. For I'm him. fine with that. <laughs> they, it's 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 sloppy. It is. I get like it absolutely is. Uh, and I mean, like, and and the movie does things where it tries to convince you it's okay. Like the bit where Chris Pine goes to his apartment. It's like I see lots of photos of him, which you know it's a choice. I guess it's your own business, and it's like. Okay, so the movie is telling us that he doesn't have a family or any dependents, and therefore his life doesn't matter. Um, like nobody will miss him, and it's like this like, makes it better somehow. 
Um, this this should have been the moral conundrum yeah. where it's like, you know, they start digging into him. Oh, maybe he's a bad guy. Maybe he's like a bank robber. Then we'll feel OK about killing him. Oh, no, he's not a bank robber. But uh, he's not really a good guy. He's pretty he's pretty <laughs> self-involved. Oh, I guess he's just kind of middle of the road. Can I make this call? Should I even make this call? Even if he was a bad guy like these are the big moral questions that the movie just ignores willfully. Yeah. Because it's Superman 2 morality <laughs> rules. It's like, yeah, sure, Clark. She Now your girlfriend slash wife slash most important person in your life knows your secret identity. How are you going to react to like that? Are you going to be a grown man and trust her as another human being and as a love of your life mm -hmm. as being capable of keeping that secret? Or are you going to turn back time so that you have functionally assaulted her and possibly impregnated her and she doesn't know about it? Um, well, I guess you're going to do the second one because this is that kind of movie. Uh, but let's not dwell about it too much. Um, no, that that's one of my favorite. Uh, one of uh, a Kevin Smith bit about Superman Returns is is about like the uncomfortable conversation Lois has to have with Clark after he's returned, <laughs> which is when did you rape me? <laughs> um, because, of course, she has Superman's baby and no memory of them yeah. ever being a, a married couple. Uh, great bit. Really great bit. Yeah. And, and, and like, that's, like, that's the thing about like Wonder Woman 984 is that it operates by those rules and those rules yeah. worked in 1980. I don't know that they work in 2020. Um, and like, and right. it's, it's odd because like you have, and this is kind of one of those things where the movie is almost a monkey's paw of itself because you've had people for like eight years now since the Avengers say going, I wish they made superhero movies like the old days. I wish they'd make a movie like the Richard Donner movies. I wish that they'd make a movie that, you know, wasn't gritty or complicated or morally kind of like checkered or wasn't, you know, sort of movie that was light and fun and adventurous mm -hmm. and didn't have us dwelling heavily on the consequence of our hero's action. And it's like, well, have I suddenly got the movie for you? Um, even, even in Richard Donner's Superman, Lex Luthor goes to jail. I mean, it's practically a spa. He, go, he, he goes, escapes he by hot air balloon. That's not, that's two. He's, he, he gets dropped off in jail. <laughs> he gets dropped off in jail. There's a consequence for trying to blow up California. Yeah, but again, he escapes by hot air balloon. I feel like the consequences are minimal. Um, like, <laughs> that, that said, that said uh -huh. you, you know, what do we, we put in the odds on like Pedro Pascal's Max Lord being like president in like the, well, not the Snyder Cut of Justice League, but let's say, I don't know, Aquaman 3. Ooh, I like it. Um, I, I like it. I will say I actually liked Pedro Pascal's performance. I like the idea that he spent like yeah. two years under the Mandalorian mask and he's like, now I'm going to use all of my face all of the time. No, no. And it's like we, we just spent a lot of time like harping on the sloppy yeah. nature of the film. Overall, it's fine. Yeah. And part of the reason why it gets elevated to fine is because all performances yeah. are very good. Not it's not just Pedro Pascal, it's not just Gal Gadot, Gadot. It's not just Chris Pine, it's not just Kristen Wiig. Everybody everybody's on their game and everyone has good chemistry with each other. Like Kristen Wiig and Gal Gadot having a little lunchtime conversation is yeah. fun to watch. Yeah. Everybody's good all the time. Uh, I just I just want it to be a little tighter and be a little more fun to watch is yeah. all. I would watch that sitcom where Max Lord is like the quirky benefactor at the Smithsonian where like Barbara and Diane work. And it's just like he keeps showing up and he keeps doing the thing and keeps distracting them. And that, that's the premise of the sitcom. There's no superheroics whatsoever. No, that was like that sequence where Max Lord is trying to like sneakily get into Minerva's office to steal the to steal the wish gem and like, well, oh, uh, but Diana figured it out. And she's trying to find him. There was a little like there was a little farce yeah. sequence where she like walked up the stairs. Now he's down the stairs. She walks down the stairs. Now he's over there. Oh, it's so wacky. <laughs> and so there is a lot of fun to be had within the movie. It's just it's just sloppy. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. absolutely yeah. Um, I will note, by the way, that the homeless man at one point is seen waiting for Gadot. Which I That's appreciated. Right. He's he's reading the book waiting for Godot, which is the common way we mispronounce Gal Gadot's last yeah. name. I am more guilty of it than anyone. Uh, you no, know, it's fun. Um, 
did you because you got the screener did you see the post credit sequence i did not i've read about it but i haven't seen it. so i saw i saw a press screening in a cinema um and oh, i okay. saw a uh, screener that warner brothers sent me and i did go to the cinema once to see it but i wasn't hanging around in the cinema because we we're in the middle of a pandemic so i was like as soon as it's over i'm gonna put my mask yeah. on i'm gonna leave so yeah like and once again with the sloppy nature we talked about this a little bit in the spoiler free zone uh the the golden armor that wonder woman wears at the it end belongs no purpose like which, she's already which, got her powers back by that point like she doesn't need a suit of armor her body is the suit of armor um z- z- it looks fabulous it does and you know what even 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 just give me a throwaway line give me a throwaway line like like i can get there faster if i wear these Fine, like then I'm done. <laughs> if I were the wind, right? <laughs> They're aerodynamic. Um, it's... I don't care what it is. Why wear it? It's like and then it, it gets it shredded, the... and then she fights Barbara like the same way she would fight her, even if she wasn't wearing it, which is surreal, which is stupid. No, and it's like it's like this is the armor of the one, uh, the one ancient warrior who had to stay behind so we could all hide on Themyscira. Oh, and I'm very proud of myself because when I watched that in cinemas, I was like. I think if they were casting this role, I know exactly who they would cast in this role based on how much fan service is in this movie. And I was very <laughs> proud of myself for getting that. Yes. And and that's fine. Then we all got the cameo that we knew was coming since we knew Wonder Woman was making movies, uh, which is fine. Like, it's 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 a fine, cute little cameo. Um, uh, We actually uh, the family watched a couple episodes of the Wonder Woman Aww. TV show. It's on HBO Max, um, is it? It is on HBO Max, uh, mostly because they were just like, who's that? And we're like, oh, <laughs> have we got something for you? Oh, the spinning, the spinning. They laughed so hard. Uh, but that's and it's like it's all fine and it's cute. And it's like that's something that's something akin to the Stan Lee cameos where it's like that's a yeah. fun little thing in your comic book movies. This was a mid credit sequence. Um, there is no like post credit, like set up a bigger world thing. It was just Which a is cute grand. thing and it's fine. Yeah. yeah. Just a cute thing, it's fine. But like the, the golden outfit, the invisible yes. jet. Yes, that was that was that's... a crucial one. That was that was one where I was like, there's no reason that's there apart from the fact that Wonder Woman has an invisible jet. So let's just put right. it in the movie. And it's like all of a sudden she can make stuff invisible for one scene of the movie because fan service. Yep. And it's like, and that's not even the important part of that scene. The important part of that scene is the bit where they fly through fireworks and it's magical because Chris Pine is in an airplane looking at fireworks and that's what the heart of the scene is. The fact the jet is invisible is just fan service and it distracts from the beauty of that scene. Ah. And adds to the runtime because we needed to set up that they were going to get shot down. Because yeah. It's like, just let him steal a plane and get away yeah. with it. It's fine. Yeah. doesn't matter. No, you don't need to be invisible. <laughs> Yes, that it's like there. How was... do they find it when they parked it? Is there just an invisible jet parked somewhere in Egypt now? Uh, no, because it took off and flew them back. Uh, they parked it in like a cornfield, <laughs> so I assume you just look for the plane shaped yeah. dent in the cornfield. <laughs> uh, well done, no, Mr. Star Trek it... Four. <laughs> I did it. I did it. I did it. They. Yeah, it, it, it reminded me of, of kind of some of the worst aspects of other comic book yeah. movies where there is a bunch of payoff with no setup or with, like, setup that happens during the payoff. But, but like, it's it's payoff to setup that exists independent of the movie itself, which is what bothers yes. me, which is, like, it's the setup of, well, you like Wonder Woman, right? You know Wonder Woman, you know the comic books, so here is an element from the comic books. And it's like, no, the element from the comic books is I'm watching a Wonder Woman movie. That's that's the payoff. Like the setup right. is the comics and the payoff is the movie that the payoff isn't that all of a sudden she can turn a jet invisible in the middle of a movie because she did it on the TV show. It's like, no, no, no. In fact, Wonder Woman's in there is the payoff. That's that's the thing. Yeah, that 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 bothers me. This, you know what? You know, I guess just thinking about it right now is I was I was about to say, like, what they're doing is checking boxes. Right. Yeah. They're saying, like, what do people know uh, about Wonder Woman? Right. Well, yeah. OK, well, we got we you know, she's an Amazon uh, the lasso they know. Uh, okay, invisible jet. Yes, that's a thing that people know. Linda and then Carter. You know, below invisible jet is uh, is oh Linda Carter of course and Cheetah as a villain. Okay, those are all the things they know, and like that's all they were doing was checking those boxes. And I, I was thinking about like a, another example of a of a franchise or a series that only checks boxes, uh, which uh, unfortunately now is Star Wars. Ooh, which is like that's all they're doing is yeah. just like 
it serves no function. It's just like this is the box we check yeah. because that's the box they expect to be checked. Yeah. And and like again, I am hesitant to kind of do this because I think it's kind of conspiratorial. Nobody knows who wrote what part of Wonder Woman 1984. But like as somebody who reads comics, I looked at those elements and I was like, I suspect co-writer Jeff Johns was responsible for those, if only because I know how Jeff Johns writes comics. And like, to be fair, I like quite a lot of his comics. I think that, you know, his Green Lantern one is great. His early Wally West Flash one is great as well. But a large part of how he works writing comics is, hey, here's this thing that you remember from this other thing. Let me put it in a context where it works, and that will be the core context of my story. So it's like, hey, you remember Hal Jordan? He was around a bit in the 60s when I was a kid. Well, guess what? He's coming back. You remember Barry Allen? He was around a bit when I was a kid. Guess what? He's coming back. <laughs> hey, you remember Wonder Woman's Invisible Jet? He was around a bit when I was a kid. So guess what? It's coming back. Check. Yeah. Check that off. And it's like, but it lacks that like incorporation. Yeah. It is just a box being checked. And and I feel like they have, an, okay, so now where, where it's like even, even her lasso, right? Her lasso of truth. Uh, which is barely used for truth in the first Wonder Woman. It's just a weapon she has. It was like incorporated yeah. as part of her but thing, as part of the story. Because right? you can't have bondage in a movie for kids. Like the whole point of like the lasso is that it ties people up and makes them submit and makes them mm. tell the truth. So like Wonder Woman uses it. And once you're tied by the lasso, you are submissive because, well, you know, that was the subtext that we're working with here. And I right. would love for like a proper like, you know, you know, like Batman Returns PG-13 level movie of like wonder woman with her lasso of truth but i know that we're not going to get that uh which is slightly slightly frustrating darren <laughs> michelle pfeiffer's whip and wonder woman's lasso of truth come on tell me that you can't imagine now you need to be very careful doing it to be very clear because it could go very wrong very quickly that's not my thing but i'm not here to yuck your yum you know what i'm saying uh <laughs> my carl young probably um but i guess like like there there are there are things in other properties that have not just been checked but incorporated yeah. into into the yeah. world properly and this unfortunately was a scene that technically didn't even need to exist like they could have just said we took a plane we're in cairo now yeah. like you know but well, i mean it needs to exist because it gets you that sequence where steve is like because he's a pilot so he needs to fly again like as a character beat that works sure like that works sure. for me it's just the invisible because it like it's the cheetah thing we mentioned the start of the cheetah thing so let's just bring it full circle like oh, you, yeah, you yeah. look at things like movies where that stuff works so think of like and again i'm a nolan fan so i'm gonna go to batman begins i apologize for this but like batman begins is like every single part of batman will be explained as to how it fits with batman so like hmm. the most obvious one is why bats um and you know over the history of the character the reasons have varied from well because bats are cool to well one flew in through a window at a vital moment so i guess it was bats um like there's a moment in grant morrison's batman where like where alfred's basically like well thank goodness it wasn't a grasshopper um that landed in your window and god knows what right. might have happened um but i like that <laughs> nolan's like no 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 no. if it's going to be bats it's going to be for a reason it's going to be because as a child he had a traumatic experience and because batman's about fear it's about his fear so his fear is bats so he becomes mm -hmm. a bat in order to own his fear that is why he is batman and that's like that's like that is yeah. the core basis of your character that level of explanation makes sense whereas wonder Woman 1984 is like well she's a cheetah person yeah <laughs> That's it. She's a cheetah person because that's what she was in the yeah, comics. Yeah. Moving on. <laughs> no follow up. There will be no follow up no. questions. <laughs> like when, like all <laughs> when when one woman goes like Barbara, no. what have you done to yourself? Like part of me wonders if like there's a moment where Barbara goes, I don't actually know. So we're going to fight. Like the reason why we're fighting is because I can't explain this and it's awkward. Um, but like. They even they did like partial credit there. We're like she's a cryptozoologist, yeah. so she's into animals. And, Have and the cheetah print the like lunch? the cheetah, yeah the cheetah print kind of like shoes and like the cheetah print that what she a, wears. What it's I'm saying is like during the lunch scene, add a few extra lines of dialogue where she's like, "Let me go geek on you about cats. Like they're <laughs> super cool, right? Like <laughs> you want to hear how crazy this is." Batman Returns, and I love Batman Returns, but let's face it, its version of Catwoman is interesting, if we're going to be mm. diplomatic about it. Batman Returns' version of Catwoman does more to explain why cats than Wonder Woman 1984 does to explain why cheetahs. Yes. Yes. 
absolutely both and that live makes no in sense and like batman returns both live makes in no fairy sense. tale yeah, fantasy yeah, lands yeah, yeah. but yes there is a at least visual connection it might yeah. not work thematically but who cares visually well, it does yes. she's a cat person i guess um to, to oh, use that internet score kind of reference <laughs> um oh excuse Ooh, you all right uh but yes like the so many sloppy 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 Overall, fine. Like, if you already have an HBO Max subscription, you've probably already yeah. seen this because, like, this is here's the other part of the story is even though this is very sloppy and receiving all sorts of mixed reception on the very internet, very strong re it, mixed reception on the internet, very strong mix, mixed reception, it has performed well enough to already green light Wonder Woman 3. Well, what was that number? I want to say you might have shared it like over half of HBO Max subscribers watched it on Christmas. Yeah. That's huge. Like huge numbers. Yeah. And a huge uh, subscription boost as well. Like the, like that. Mm. that's that's the game here. And that makes sense. And like we should talk very briefly about the, the Internet's weird response to this as well. I know that we're, I know that we're very long and I apologize to listeners. You know what? Fuck it. We're going two hours. It's just happened. <laughs> okay. it's, just, it's happened. Okay. Very briefly. The, the weird thing about the Internet's response to it, which was like the movie initial reviews were like this is interesting and weird and like that was the initial reaction and mm. then like on christmas it was like this is terrible and the worst thing ever and everyone was like what the hell were those people smoking who saw it 10 days ago who thought it was interesting and weird not who thought it was great mm. not who thought it was the best superhero movie ever people were like yeah this not sure it entirely works but it's fun and it's enjoyable and it's bright and it's colorful um and yeah, it, yeah. it's kind of really interesting that that reaction happened uh, because like it's become this this weird internet thing where everyone's all like, yeah, but see what happened is Warner Brothers just like screened it to like influencers and fans on YouTube. And like, first of all, I'm a critic outside the US. It was released outside the US on the 16th of December. The critics who saw it before it was released in America are European critics. They're they're not all YouTube fans. Um, <laughs> right. And you know it's great that you guys feel that way about European film criticism. Um, only gave you auteur theory. Nothing, nothing to take too seriously. Nothing more. Nothing more. Like auteur theory and like fandom of like Wonder Woman ninety eight four apparently <laughs> is what European <laughs> film criticism is good for these days. Um, yeah, but yeah. like, but like, I like that 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 happened, and there's this really intense blowback to it. And you know, I mean, first of all immediately like becomes conspiratorial where it's like oh well it's it's yes. it's a result of oh obviously people like warner brothers bought reviews which is again as a film critic is something you see when disney released movies and you're like oh disney are like giving me bucket loads of cash in a car park that's why i'm currently recording this from my parents house um you know right now in case listeners are wondering what the background is here um well, it's not the it's what that's what one of my favorite <laughs> dumbest theories is just like oh anything that gets good reviews that i didn't like uh, obviously bought off. Yeah. 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 And like the obvious answer there is, well, the obvious one is people like different things and taste is different and that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, the second yeah. big difference there is I would suggest that, you know, they're European film critics and historically European film critics have had slightly different tastes than American critics. We tend to like certain movies more. We tend to particularly mm -hmm. like Americana movies more, ironically enough. Mm -hmm. So like we love Clint Eastwood as a director before Americans kind of cottoned on that he was an auteur. Uh, we kind of loved John Ford, the whole idea of author, author theory emerging from that. But even things like, mm. say, Joker, which got great reviews in the in uh, Europe and won the Venice Film Festivals. And again, this sounds like a fucking trailer from, um, what is it, from Tropic Thunder. Winner yeah. of the Venice International Film Festival's coveted Golden Bear Award. Uh, Joker. Um, yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Really? Europeans love that stuff. Joker? Yeah. We love that stuff. It's uh. so American. Um <laughs> It's like, it's the most American thing it's, imaginable. It's so American. It's like a Scorsese movie and a comic book movie and an oh, urban malaise oh. movie and a New York in the 70s movie. It's all of America in one. But I mean, even things like, say, Kong Skull Island, uh, which European oh. critics loved and American critics were so, so on. And that sort of stuff. Like, I, there is a tangible yeah. difference there. And the third big difference, I would say, is that, like, the early reviews, because they were international, probably came from critics who saw them in a cinema on a big screen in a room full of people. Mm. And I wonder if maybe, and again, this is perhaps a generalization and perhaps a bigger debate and not necessarily something we cram into a final three minutes of the podcast. But I do wonder if there's like, if Wonder Woman 1984 is a kind of movie, like a lot of other kind of movies, that maybe plays better on a bigger screen when you are surrounded with a larger audience than it does when you're watching it yourself. And as you pointed, you can pause, you can get up, you can control it. Um, if there's a difference mm -hmm. there in the ambience as you're watching it, if like movies work 100%. differently in context. And I think that maybe of that was a they do. Of course they do. Ab absolutely. And all of those are 
great factors as to why. And, but and like you said, it's not even like the European press was yeah. ranting and raving about it. They all said it's fine. <laughs> I mean, it's a movie. You can see it in cinemas. Like, literally, like I, I do press, co I do press coverage uh, for an Irish radio station, and like I was talking to the morning show about Wonder Woman 1984, and their immediate response, like their first question to me was, "Is it a movie? Can I see it in cinemas?" Yes, I'm seeing it this weekend, and I'm like, I know that makes me somewhat irrelevant as a critic, but I'm going to talk about how I feel about it anyway. And they're like, "Never mind. That's the important thing. Can you see it in the cinema? Is it new?" Um, right. Yeah. Right. And so it's like it's like the backlash against critical reception is you like you weren't mean. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and like it happens every, and again. It always happens. It happens with like prestige pictures at like film festivals, mm. like La La Land and like Three Billboards. And like sure, and again, sure. like the, the the dynamic there is well, obviously critics are all sitting together in a little room agreeing on what they think is a good film. And it's like, have you talked to critics? Have you listened to a podcast? If you put two critics in a room and ask them to agree <laughs> on something, you're going to end up with a two hour conversation about Wonder Woman. And it's worth pointing out. Like myself and Jack broadly agree on Wonder Woman and we somehow managed to talk for two hours about it, the differences in our opinions about it. Yeah. That's our thing, man. We're we're kind of pedantic dickheads about movies. Try and get us to agree but... on anything. I'm like... But it's like like I, I I hear what you're saying. And and of course it's like there, you know, there's a backlash, there's a backlash to the backlash, and guess what? Literally none of it yeah. matters because it performed well where it was supposed to um, you know we're getting a wonder woman 3 it might be more the same it doesn't matter everybody watched it everybody got a subscription to hbo max yeah. job done so like yeah. congratulations to the filmmakers you did it you, you <laughs> did what you were supposed to do part of me though does wonder like how much of that is wonder woman and how much of that is just like this is the only blockbuster yeah. And how much of it is and, also just a sense yeah. of Warner Brothers wanting to assure other filmmakers, see, you're not going to get thrown under the bus just because we're releasing mm -hmm. you on HBO Max. We'll still give you, give you nice things like the ability to make a sequel. But trust us. Yeah. Come on, Chris, Denny, mellow out a bit. Come on, Come on. Be, be a Come team on, player. Dune, Dune 2021, yeah. HBO Max. Yeah, like I, Everybody's going to watch Like, it. I mean, I wonder if Warner Brothers just said to Denny Villeneuve, look, we will let you make a second Dune movie. Would Denny be like, oh, okay, yeah. fine. You can have it on your stupid streaming service as well. He would. You know he would. Like, you're guaranteeing me Dune 2 right now? The set, Dune Part 2? I'm done. Yeah. Yes, yeah, fine. HBO Max, Release whenever it on you the want phone. It. I'm like, turn Put it on YouTube. I don't care. It's on Quibi. I don't care that Quibi's dead. We're bringing Quibi back and we're releasing Dune on it. Um... Jack gets his Christmas wish. <laughs> Ah, oh, okay. Well, great. No, I think I think we'll wrap yeah. up there just because that seems yeah, sorry, like a nice yeah. a nice point. We listen. This is our jobs. We talk about movies. That's why we are critics in general because we like movies so much. Um, uh, thanks for watching and or listening to this Wonder Woman. It's out now on HBO Max. Maybe watch it. Yeah, I, don't know. <laughs> I mean the original Wonder Woman's on there as well. If you're listening, uh, Batman the animated mm -hmm. series and Batman Beyond are Ooh. both available on HBO Max as of the first of January and are well worth your time oh. as well in terms of looking for a superhero. So fix. good. So I mean, Jack, right so after good. we finish listening to ourselves on this, we can just log off and watch it, right? That's how this works. We're uh, doing this what, live, yeah. Because we're doing this live, I just need to hit publish. Um, so that's what I'm going to go do right now. You know what? It's been a hot minute since I've seen Batman <laughs> Beyond. I think I'm going to rewatch that. So a lot good. of it is quite good. Some of it is not, uh, but a lot, lot of it is quite I good. I remember a lot of it being quite good. I'm a huge fan. I have the the special yeah. like Blu-ray yeah. restoration yeah. of the animated series. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. ooh, so good. I really want them to do Superman because they've done Justice League and they've done the original Batman, the animated series. I just want right? them to complete the set. The Adventures of Superman, like that cinematic universe yeah. was the best. It really was. Like people complain <laughs> about the DCEU and it's like, sure, fine. But like we already have a really good version right here. Like... This is the thing where it's like last week, I was like, I don't really care about what Zack Snyder does because he's doing interesting new stuff because we already have a good <laughs> Batman movie. We already have some good Superman movies with some questionable sexual politics that we just discussed. But I mean, like, <laughs> come on, you can try new things. It's like you already have a great DC universe right here. Go do some fun stuff with the other stuff. So have like Pedro Pascal play Donald Trump for some reason. Why, yeah. why yeah. not? All right. Well, thanks for watching yes. and or listening, everyone. Once again, my name has been Jack Packard. I'm Darren Mooney. And we hope you have a good new year. Ooh. Sorry, my lighting is very... <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye.